how I put it? It was like, what do you care about them? What do you care about those people? What difference does it make to you? Take care of your own life. Do the best you can for you and your family. What do the rest of the people mean to you? They don't mean anything to you. They're just serfs. They're just people. You know, what's the end goal? The end goal is to get everybody chipped. To control the whole society. They, they want a one world government controlled by them. Everybody has an RFID chip implanted in them. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip. One, two, one, two. Ramish community and all refugees of Clan World, welcome back to the one and only. Rise above, generate, generate. Rise above, extinguish fear. Rise above, abstract. Greetings all, it's Friday night, we're back. And as you might see, I'm not here with my regular co-host. He has been stolen from me by his fair northern maiden. So in a, the place of Andy PG this week, we've got another MC Manic. Welcome back, mate. Thanks. Hello. <laughs> Thanks. Hello. A, a, a humble, a humble greeting there. It's been a long week. It's been a long week. Yeah. So uh, it's great to have Johnny in the studio. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm just going to shatter everyone's illusions right now. We're not going to be emceeing tonight. As you can see, there's no DJs here. We, it's just the two of us. We have got an amazing guest that we're going to be speaking to in just a moment, though. He goes by the moniker of allegedly Dave. I'm sure you might have heard of him. He has been on the show before. Um, this guy's a bit of an enigma. Looking forward to chatting to Dave in just a moment. Um, let's just share the screen. As always, right, we've got to share, start the stream. A few announcements, regular business. It is Friday night. It's 9 p.m. That can mean only one thing. It's Rise Above Live. Let's, uh, let's get where we are. So, allegedly, Dave will be joining us in just a minute. I have to ha say a massive shout to Vinny Eastwood on our last episode. Johnny, did you catch Vinny Eastwood? Yes, on I did. I watched the whole thing. What a powerhouse. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Of, of a man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, he was most, we were most impressed with Vinny Eastwood. I didn't, I hadn't watched a lot, a lot of the guy before. Andy PG was a big fan. He, he said, we have to have him on the show. I'll tell you what, we had some comments. Uh, Andy and Lance were quite stoned after um, <laughs> Vinny Eastwood left. I was like, yeah, do you know why? Because we actually, literally sat back and we just enjoyed the Vinny Eastwood show for a good two or three hours. Yeah. And smoked all our joints and just really enjoyed him as a guest. So, quite yeah. a funny geezer as well. Very funny, very talented guy, very <coughs> articulate. Yeah. Um, a fantastic guest. Can't wait to speak to Vinny again, to be honest. Um, so remember, Rise Above Live is always free. It's not behind a paywall. It's always broadcasting free, but it's not free to produce this show. So if you want to support us, one way that you can do it is buying merchandise. And uh, the lovely Becky S has got this fantastic collection over on Redbubble of all of these amazing new merchandise items. Yes, there really are. Rise above bed blankets, aprons, rucksacks, baseball caps, everything you can imagine is over at the Redbubble collection. And all of these proceeds basically go to cover our costs, which believe it or not are pretty high. That's where the show looks and sounds so damn good. Don't, don't believe me? Yeah, and if you want to uh, get the regular range of Rise Above merch, it's at riseabove.tv. That's all of the clothing, hand-designed by myself. Um, if you don't want to buy merch, a great way to support us, just a few quid at a time, is buy us a coffee. Uh, this goes directly into our production costs, our streaming costs, our software bills, and all of the things that we have to pay to make Rise Above happen. Thank you, please. <laughs> <laughs> And speaking of merch, you, you, you must have worn this T-shirt about 33 million times. Honestly, mate, I'm surprised that it hasn't shrunk like my other ones. Because I wear these in the gym as well, because, you know, I like to represent. And um, I don't know what it is, all my clothes, just uh, I'm shit at washing. You know what I mean? I'm a bloke. So. Maybe you're washing on, to, on, a, on a high heat, Johnny. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah, but potentially. I think so. I think so. Any recommendations? <laughs> no, no, that's all I know. I'm not, I I'm not sure. I don't, and press, I don't do my own washing. The Empress does that for me. Um, but yeah, I think it's something to do with the heat. So like I said, there's no music tonight. We're not emceeing. However, if you want to catch myself and MC Manic uh, doing the business, 
Remember, there is an event in Dorset going on in June, the weekend of uh, June the 28th. Sounds beautiful festival. <laughs> Remember we were saying about um, Katie Hopkins at this? Yeah. It's been upgraded. Now we've got Matt Letizier instead. <laughs> For anyone that didn't like Katie Hopkins, don't worry, she's not there anymore. Now it's been upgraded with Matt Letizier. Oh yeah, allegedly Dave's there as well. Nice. Yeah, um, yeah, so we'll get to meet Dave in person again. Looking forward to that. Um, if you want to get your tickets, I'm going to put a QR code on the screen right now. Sounds Beautiful Festival, an exclusive two-hour set from the Rise Above crew. I think I'm taking five DJs and us two. Two MCs, five DJs, two hours, multi-genre set. Um, that should nice. be that should be enough. I've got to pick up um, <clears throat> to do the trick. DJ Sensible as well is a mate of mine. He's going to be playing. Um, I think he plays techno. Always uh, bangs out a good set. So big up, Dave. Look, looking forward to your set, mate. Big shout out to DJ Sensible. Oh yeah, we've got to give a shout. It, there's a happy there's a, a happy birthday shout that needs to be made. Uh, a very prominent member of our community goes by the name of Claire or the Glitterati. Happy birthday to Claire. Big shout out to Baz, uh, Rattis, liaison officer, and everyone in the in the Ramish community. But a big happy birthday today to Claire. Happy birthday, Claire. Yes, we have to get that out of the way. So don't forget, come and see us at Sounds Beautiful Festival um, in Dorset. Scan the QR code. And we've got these guys on the show next week. There might be some ticket giveaways or a discount or something like that for you guys, I think. Nice. And we're also going to have um, Pirate Radio... You're back in on April, April the 5th. Yeah. We're going to get Magix and Gritty back to back. They smashed it at the New Year's show. So really looking forward to a grime and dubstep and garage set from those guys. Yeah, boy. Right. Um, almost getting to allegedly Dave, guys. Don't worry. As you know, we have a learning portal here at Rise Above. <clears throat> it's called Rock Academy. We do it in Zoom conferences, seminars on a Thursday night, usually about once a month. Um, and the next one, we've got none other than Inspector Veg. Everyone loves Inspector Veg. He is a fountain of knowledge about uh, cleaning out your mid suit, your meat suit, <laughs> getting rid of parasites, um, the electric food list, herbal remedies, and the great news is this is a chance to get interactive with him. Ha actually, have a one-on-one -on -one consultation in a small, intimate group online. The interactive health workshop from uh, Ra Academy with Inspector Veg, Thursday, the 18th of <coughs> April. I'm just going to put a QR code on the screen because we love to use these Schwab codes. This is how you can get to it. You can go to riseabove.tv to the Raw Academy page or you can scan the QR code here. And um, anyone that has previously attended Raw Academy will be getting a 33% discount code. Of course. Obviously. Yeah, it'd just be rude if we didn't do things like that. So yeah, big shout out to Inspector Veg. I I've got a feeling he might stop by the show next week. Nice. Um, just to talk about what's going to be going on in this health seminar here. Um, oh, right. Okay. I think it's, I think it's time. It's time. Dave, give us a thumbs up if you're ready. I can see you in the digital green room there, mate. Dave is giving me a thumbs up. Right, let me get rid of this. So we've got a special guest this week. We spoke to this guy once before. I believe it was the back end of 2022, maybe the start of 2023. But here he is. He's back. It's none other than allegedly Dave. Welcome to Rise Above. Hiya. How you doing, Dave? <laughs> oh, all good, all good. Yeah, um, another day in paradise. Literally. So first of all, guys, in the live chat, can we just get some feedback that Dave is sounding good and he's on a nice level with us before we um, enter this epic chat with the man like allegedly Dave. You are not broadcasting from the UK, though, are you, mate? No, I'm in uh, sunny St. Lucia. Um, and by the way, if you can hear a fan, let me know and I'll turn it off because uh, okay. it's so it's so hot here, you know, I, I need a fan. <laughs> just rubbing it in. It, it's, let me guess, it's sunny, hot and dry there, right? Absolutely. 33 oh, degrees. 33 degrees in the house. All the, all the things that it's, it's blatantly not back here in the land of uh, the cold and grey. It's minus 33. Yeah. <laughs> the UK. Yeah. No, Unfortunately, I'm heading, I'm heading back there um, in a couple of days. So, um, yeah, I'm not looking forward to it. Unlucky. Not looking <laughs> forward to it. I don't blame you. Now, you've been on the show once before and we, it was a real smorgasbord. We talked about a lot. We covered so many different subjects. I can't remember if it was back end of 2022 or early 2023. And either way, the last time... Oh, yeah, I've got a bit of a bone to pick with you. The last time we were supposed to see you was in the flesh last year at the Easter event. Now, sadly, you couldn't... You didn't make it. What happened? Uh, what happened was pretty much the day before, uh, my car got taken by the, uh, by the Rosers. Yeah. Um, Long story, but uh, literally, I just set up this uh, this massive tour, 
and uh, you know just started on the on the tour, and all of a sudden my car gets taken, and uh, <laughs> that's it. I was really like I was stuck. I'm like over a hundred dates all set up, and no way of getting there. So literally the day that I was supposed to go down to to see you was the day I was picking up a new car. Oh my god! So do you think they? Uh, th did you post about your tour? Um, so I guess you must have let people know on social media that it was happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I couldn't let everybody down, but yeah, it it all worked out. But the only thing I had to sacrifice was, uh, you know, turning up at your place. Okay, well, yeah, I'm not going to lie, mate. There were quite a few disappointed people asking where is allegedly Dave. I had to do the uh, event <laughs> event uh, hosting and, and uh, let everyone know that sadly you couldn't make it. But things like that happen in, in the Matrix, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, big apologies, but you know what? Not much I could do, really. No, fair enough. We know that you would you would have been there if you if you could. Now, we've had lots of very interesting chats with people recently about a whole host of different subjects. One of them um, has been the Mandela effect. And I feel like this one with a couple of other subjects is sort of like a little precursor about what you want to talk about tonight. We had a really great chat with Brian Stavely at Dose of Reality and Shiva Shampoo, which is his friend. Um, I know that you've recently gone on their show as well. You've recently had a chat with Sheep Farm because it seems like you have a bit of a new angle. Um, that you could say a new theory that if, correct me if I'm wrong, mate, sort of encompasses the fourth dimension, mm -hmm. maybe what the Mandela effect is and the, the, the theory or the subject that we cover quite a lot here is NPCs. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, you're, the show you did with Brian was the uh, direct in inspiration for me going on to Brian's show. Because, oh, uh, I was really? Brilliant. Yeah, I was listening to your show. Brian was saying a few things. I was like, oh, ah, yeah, I can, <laughs> I can talk about that. So I, I just gave Brian a call and, uh, and he had me on. Oh, and by the way, you mentioned Vinnie Eastwood in your, uh, in your preamble. Yes. Um, Vinnie Eastwood is the one who gave me allegedly Dave. You're joking. No, I mean... Um, well, he coined the term allegedly Dave. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 I think I've been on his show about three or four times. And every time I, w I went on his show, I was called something different. You know, I was Dave Starbuck, um, uh, Dave Moore, Dave. What? So, he, you know, I came on the show, I think a fourth time. And he, he said like, oh, what am, what am I going to call you this time? And I, before I could open my mouth, he said, uh, well, I'm just going to call you allegedly Dave. <laughs> And, and the rest is history from that day on, it and just stuck. It stuck, yeah. So, sorry, I'm, I wanted to uh, bring no, that No, 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 we love little time. tangents here, mate. And, and let's be fair, I think Vinny Eastwood, it, the first time I spoke to him was two weeks ago, um, two weeks ago this Friday. And I think he's a legend, a larger-than-life character, like I said, um, and a very, very interesting guy. I spoke to him back in 2011. Um, oh, wow. When, yeah, when we were talk when most of us were in the uh, new uh, Free Man on the Land movement. Right, okay. Yeah, because I know yeah. Vinny's been at this stuff for quite a while. I think he said 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so so no, you're right. I'm, I've, I've been focused on this area um, uh, because it's, it seems like I've been, um, I've been looking at um, various pieces of information and it's been almost given to me a chunk at a time. And... Uh, there was a reason for it, I think. Um, yeah, going to say something. No, no, no. Sorry, I actually just did a micro burp. I wasn't so oh. going to say anything. <laughs> I just tried to disguise it by keeping my mouth shut. That's all. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I, I had, I had a, an encounter with a uh, recreational plant uh, a little while ago. Okay. Um, and um, what it would do for me, it would teach me stuff. It would tell me things. Um, so one of the experiences I had, I call them cannabis journeys, um, was I found myself being pushed through this reality into another reality. Um, I, I just had a bit too much of the cannabis oil. Just so just a so how, bit much, too how much, much cannabis did you intake to actually start physically leaving this reality? I'm, I'm intrigued, mate. It was, it was, uh, it was the oil. And uh, ah, it, it only takes little like a blob on the end of a matchstick to blow your head off. And I had just you, a bit too much. Were you, were you, were you taking it orally or were you smoking it? 
at the time, no, I'd put it um, smear a bit on um, you know to, between two bits of chocolate and uh, and right, eat it. Okay, yeah, so um, it can actually be a lot stronger when you when you take it all. Way, way, way more intense. Um, so yeah, I found myself being pushed into this other reality, and the reality I was looking at was the same as I you know as a place I was just leaving, but in wireframe format. <laughs> so you know, like. Um, when people sort of create something in a, in a 3D program, they'll yep. draw it up in a kind of wireframe and then they'll render it. Um, I was seeing the wireframe version of this reality. Like um, and, the CAD, the 3D modeling uh, programs, yes. when you create yeah. like a, a 3D uh, object in the, in, the, in the space on the computer and it's got the, the grids on it. Yeah, so it's just the, if it was a table, it would just be the, a line for the top of the table and lines, you know, for the legs and, and stuff. Um, but it was, it was like the prototype version of this place. Um, and I didn't quite understand what it was at the time. Um, as I was saying to Brian, uh, I didn't have the level of consciousness to understand what I was seeing. So it was just, it was just weirdness at the time. Um, like the like the blueprint of this reality kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. I I just thought uh, it was it was it was literally the wireframe, and uh, the you know this reality had the the surfaces just painted on them. Like if this but, reality is is Windows Ten, you you were running on MS DOS, the 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 frame <laughs> the framework reality program behind behind the uh, simulation or whatever it is. That that's what I thought. But I, um, as, as I started understanding more, more things, what I saw was uh, Windows 10 was that, that dimension and our reality is MS-DOS. Uh, or, it goes a bit deeper than that. But, wow. Wait, um, wait, wait, hold on. So that's like a reversal. You, you were sort of, you were seeing something that was potentially much simpler and sch like a schematic, but it yes. might not have been happening before. As I said, my level of consciousness at the time, I looked at it and I saw, I saw something primordial. So you know, before you know, sort of um, a, a, an inferior version of reality. That's right. what I thought, but I've come, I've come since to realise that actually, um, it's it's a superior version of this of this reality. Um, and yeah, maybe you'll get get what I mean when I go a little further okay, into okay. it. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, so essentially, that that was my first view of of something different. So, um, just to carry on with that cannabis journey, um, as I was being pushed into this other reality, um, I was really excited. I was thinking, "Wow, this is amazing!" But there was another part of me that went, "No." If you go, you're not going to come back again. And it threw me out of the trip. Um, so I kind of closed my eyes and went back in and it threw me out straight away. And the third time I tried to go in, um, I was in somewhere, you know, a different place. And it was like it was a conference room and there are all different parts of me around sitting around the table and the cannabis. And, um, and I was like a little kid, um, you know, running around the, around the side of the table going, I want to see it, I want to see it. And every, all these uh, parts of me were discussing what they were going to do about me. <laughs> and, uh, and they were like, okay, he can't take all this information all at once. It's too much for him. What are we going to do? And, they were dis and I was like going, but I want to see, and they were ignoring me. Um, so they came up with, okay, we're going to give him a small chunk at a time and uh, let him sort of understand and, and sort of assimilate that. And then we'll give him the next bit. And that's, uh, that's when um, I got thrown out again. And um, I, got the first, I got the first chunk, as it were. Um, so if you watch um, some of my videos in order, which is difficult now because YouTube are whipping them down um, fast. <laughs> they're, they're not all there them. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they're not. Um, but if you watch them in order, you can actually see as I get a new chunk of information, I make a video about it and, uh, and you can see my sort of uh, progression here. Um, so what um, the, the, the last video I put out um, on this kind of subject was how the most high created the universe. 
And it was just a, um, a logical progression of how a singular being that is all there is, you know, how we would explore reality or, or existence. Um, and so the next chunk was this, what I'm, I'm finding out that that, that realm that I, I briefly glimpsed was what we would call the fourth dimension. So what do I mean by the fourth dimension? So it's difficult for us to conceptualize it because we're three dimensional beings, but we can figure it out if we kind of go down the dimensions then back up again. Right. So this is okay. what I mean. If, um, okay. So if you look at, um, a three dimensional cube, right. If you cut that cube in half and look at its cross section, now you're looking at a flat square, a plane. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if you take that flat plane, that square and cut it in half and look at its cross section, you'll see a line. Okay. So if you cut that line in half and look at its cross section, now you're looking at a point. So now you've gone all the way down the dimensions, right? So if we go back up, right, a line is essentially a whole load of points all merged together into one thing. Okay. Okay. So then you go up another dimension to the, to the second dimension. Um, a, a, a square is essentially a whole bunch of lines all merged together into one thing. Okay. So going up another dimension to the third dimension, a cube is a whole bunch of flat squares all merged together into one thing. So the fourth dimension must be a whole bunch of cubes all merged together into one thing. Yes. So, so we know the three dimensions, you know, length, width, and, and height, what would be the fourth dimension? So going up a dimension means another way of measuring something like, uh, let's imagine a chair, right? So, um, one dimension, you know, it's length, two dimensions, you know, it's length and it's width, three dimensions, you know, it's height and length, width and height. So what's another way of measuring that chair that's different from the other three ways? Any ideas? Well, it's very hard to conceptualize while we're living in three dimensions where the where that fourth dimension is projected to because you can see where you project a flat square to a cube it goes this way because we but you know i i think i've perceived the fourth dimension when i've used not a cannabis journey but a spirit molecule journey but to yes. bring that language back you know, to observe the room or the coffee table in the fourth dimension is so breathtaking. <laughs> and then you've got to think of some language. And, you know, language is my thing. And it's still not easy to explain it. Right. Well, OK. I think I've got a way of explaining it, though. Take it away, so Dave. The, uh, the, the other way to, um, to measure it, and somebody got it in the chat, is time. Because a chair doesn't instantly exist, didn't pop into existence. There was a that chair began somewhere and will will end somewhere, and we just interact with one or, or particular slices of that chair, right? So, um, so you know, we look at a chair in three dimensions. It's a chair, right? But if you were to look at that chair in four dimensions, what you would see is a flash of light, whether it is emitted by the sun or whatever, um, being absorbed by a leaf. That leaf creates uh, wood for a tree. That tree gets cut down, turned into lumber. Somebody has an idea and designs a, a chair. Okay, that, ch that lumber gets turned into a chair and that's where we interact with it. Those slices, when it's a, a chair, we interact with that. Um, and then at some point that chair might break and then end up in a landfill and over time turn into a liquid. Yeah? And then, you know, that liquid will break down into a gas and that gas might ignite and turn back into a flash of light. So the four dimensional version of that chair is like wow. all of that, all that history merged into one thing. Yeah, and That's trying why you to explain, can't see it. that all at once. Now, when when I've had that experience, I'm not going to lie, Dave. I, I think what I was doing was actually glimpsing into the fourth dimension and seeing a short span of time, either way. And to me, it looked like things were projected off each 
way diagonally as if you could see 10 frames into the future and 10 frames into the back almost like a bit like a kaleidoscope geometrically geometrically projects things um i had an experience like that i wasn't obviously wasn't seeing the full fourth dimension because when i looked at the coffee table i would have seen its conception to its demise but what i could have been seeing was a little flash into the future and a little flash into the past maybe just a few frames that's really really interesting you've said that what your consciousness could could make sense of yeah. this is the thing about the fourth dimension we need to have a uh, um conceptual pigeonholes for what we're seeing otherwise we can't make any sense of it yeah we've got to be able to say it was like this or it was something like that <laughs> if we don't have that then we can't understand it we can't we can't conceptualize it. It's like so cause, cause and effect, that, isn't it? It's like uh, nothing well, happens by chance. Um, well, no, it's it's more context. In order to make sense of um, the you know amazing stuff that lies beyond this dimension, you have to have something uh, a, a level of consciousness that allows um, you to put whatever you're seeing into context. If you can't do that, then you can't make sense of it. And yeah, because we like, have to conceptualize as well by using past experience, because yeah. that's what's all, that's what the boundaries of our reality really are. It's actually the the width and breadth of our past experiences. If you haven't ever witnessed or experienced something before, then it doesn't really exist in your reality yet. That's it, and that's why when I when I had that cannabis experience, I couldn't see that that glimpse of this dimension as anything but like a you know the pre precursor to this it was just a an inferior version of this world but as i start to understand other things now i could put it into a different different pigeonhole i could i could see it for what it really is so just like the chair you know is like um it, it's a fourth dimensional chair is a um a series of of events in time which we just interact with slices of it, of it. Um, the whole of time and space is there in the fourth dimension, all together, all merged together into one thing. So the beginning of our universe and the end of our universe and everything in that universe is all in one place. Yes. Um, in the fourth dimension. I once heard David Icke explain this very, very well for anyone that can't wrap their mind around if you were in the fourth dimension you would be able to view time and space in the third dimension as a complete thing. And the, and the, and the an analogy that he used would be very much the same as if you were able to pick up a DVD and you could just look at the disc and you can see the start, the finish, the middle, the whole movie all in one. And essentially you can do that as a DVD viewer. You know, you can go backwards and forwards. It's sort of like that. That is the fourth dimensional view of the three dimensional time and space, which is the DVD. Does that make yeah. sense? Absolutely, the whole that the whole of time and space, from beginning to end, and everywhere, um, everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah, it's it's all there in that fourth dimension. Now, here's the amazing thing, though: we have direct access to that dimension. In fact, you spend half your life there <laughs> without knowing it. Yeah. Um, so we have two hemispheres of the brain. Why, why is that? Why have we got two hemispheres with totally, two totally different personalities, should we say, two totally different ways of, of doing things? Well, you know, um, the left-hand side of your brain literally um, roots you in the third dimension. All your senses are, are connected to the, to the left-hand side of your brain. So... You see stuff and uh, you hear stuff and you, you react to those things. So, um, so the left-hand side roots you here in the third dimension. Your right-hand side lives in the fourth dimension. Right? And you have, you have spiritual senses. So um, imagine, imagine your mother right now. Okay? So the picture you're looking at, the picture of your mother that you can see, you're seeing with your spiritual eyes, right? Um, if I've got you to imagine a duck quacking, well, you're hearing that quack with almost like spiritual ears, okay? Um, 
your inner ears. Your inner ears, yeah. But I, I don't think it's, you know, that's just a metaphor, inner. It's not actually inner, right? It's actually in a different realm. Dave, could you not argue that when you imagine the sound of the duck quacking versus hearing uh, a 3D duck quacking in the outer verse, right? Could you not argue that exactly the same part of the brain actually hears the quack? The only difference is that one is using the outside interface of the eardrum and the other is actually using the inner uh, vision or the inner creator. It's still the same part right. of the brain hearing the quack, isn't it? No, no, it's, it's your right hand side. Your right hand side, we call it, you know, the creative side. Yeah, it's yeah. where our imagination is. But our imagination, you know, we, we dismiss this idea of imagination as us, you know, making up pictures in our heads. But no, it's, it's way more powerful than that. Yeah. What certainly. your imagination is, is literally creating in the fourth dimension. And if you create something in the fourth dimension, it's eventually going to find its way in the third dimension. Um, now, I, I, had a, I had a direct um, experience of that. Um, it's quite funny. I, I, back in the day, I wanted to design a car. I was a, I was a, a big two-seater sports car fan. And um, at the time, this was the early 90s, they weren't making two-seater sports cars. Right? I, I had the Spitfire, I had the X19 and so on and so on. I wanted a new car, a new two-seater sports car. So I, I designed one and I actually made a, a one-fifth scale model of this car. Right? And uh, it was, it was, I thought it was beautiful. Um, and I was, gonna, I was gonna get a uh, Volkswagen Beetle chassis and build the thing, right? Did you give it a name? Um, <laughs> I bet you give it a cool uh, name. Go on. No, I didn't because I, I, I it got a name actually because uh, I was, I was kind of building it when I was at work as well, and um, my mates gave, christened it Project Dog Shit. But <laughs> <laughs> Project Dog Shit. I don't know what I can't remember why, but that's what they called it. So it got the name Project Dog Shit. You know. <laughs> PDS one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, the, um, what happened was um, uh, it became too expensive a hobby. Not my words, right? For any, any of the married men out there. Uh, oh, the accountant called called quits to that hobby, right? <laughs> absolutely. So, um, so I never, I never actually built the thing. But f about four or five years later, I was walking down the street in New York, and I looked down, and there was my car. There was exactly the same car in absolute detail that I, I designed and made the model of sitting there right in, right, right in front of me. What, a full-size right? one? Yeah, it was, a, it was a Mazda MX-5. I, I literally made, a, made this, designed this thing right, um, like five, or five years before it, it came out. And there it was. It, it appeared. You know, even though I didn't make it, somebody else made it <laughs> because... I designed it. I spent so much time, you know, crafting it in my imagination, right? That was the wireframe version of this world, yeah? Yeah. Uh, that's where my imagination was doing its creating. And then eventually it, it found its way here. So everything you create over there in the, uh, in the fourth dimension, right, appears here. And you inhabit the fourth dimension every time you go to sleep, every time you daydream. Just step back there for a second. When you're daydreaming, right, um, say so you're staring out the window, looking at the sky, you're not seeing the sky, are you? <laughs> you're, you're seeing whatever you're dreaming, you're dreaming up, maybe dr uh, racing in Le Mans or something, you know? You're, you're looking at that with your spiritual eyes and your, your real senses are, are suppressed, yeah? So you can't hear, you know, you're doing it at school, you're daydreaming at school and the teacher's alone going, Dave, Dave, listen to me, you know, and you can't hear her because... Did that happen a lot, Dave? That... <laughs> yeah, it did. I bet it did. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> but yeah, you see what I'm saying, that uh, your, your, your senses are now suppressed, but you're, you're focusing on these, these other senses that inhabit a different world. Um, and so, you know, by creating something in the fourth dimension, it's going to happen here. And a lot of people have had the experience 
um, manifesting a car parking space. Have either of you done that? No. What, so what you say when you're heading to a car park, you sort of use positive thinking to say, there's going to be the perfect space right where I need it and I'll be able to get in there with no problems. That space is going to be there. That yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, I do that all the time. Yeah. And, you know, you ask anybody, they'll say, yes, it works. Um, so there are traffic lights as well. Sorry. Yeah, you can you literally the amazing thing about this this life, you have the ability to shape this your world, your world, right? Uh, to have whatever experience you want to have. The only thing is, the only thing is that at this particular time in history, um, our our minds have been poisoned, our bodies have been poisoned, um, and you know we've no idea that we can do this. And every time it happens, you know, most of the time we brush it off as coincidence or or, or whatever. It's not we we disregard it. But this is something that's innately, you know, part of our natural abilities. Um, Can I just ask yeah. you a question? We have sort of like quite a, 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 um, a tongue in cheek and um, quite profound relationship here with, with the number 33. We know about all the significance of it. We noticed it kept help popping up in these news stories. We're always talking about it. And then a lot of people watching the show, including myself, started having the phenomenon where the number started appearing everywhere. Every time they looked at their watch, every time they looked at a screen, they would see 33. Every time you looked at the TV, 33. And then I would have the phenomenon of people constantly posting the screenshots of their 33 phenomenon to myself. And, and the more we were talking about it, the more it was happening. And, the, and, the, and people were saying, the amount of times I've seen 33 today is just stupid. There's no way that can have been organic. Um, and, often, and people go, no, it's because you're thinking about it that you're seeing it. And I said, well, would, would that not indicate, if that's true, would that not indicate that we do live in a hyper-interactive realm? Absolutely. That is exactly what's happening. Um, and, you know, bring it more down to a more terrestrial level. Um, if you were to decide you want to buy a new car and you said, oh, I'd like a, I'd like a red Fiesta, right? Um, the first thing that's going to happen is... You're going to see a red Fiesta. You're going to see red Fiestas everywhere, all aren't you? The place. Yeah, yeah, I've had this right. phenomenon, yeah. Now, it's not because um, now that you've decided you wanted to have that red Fiesta, now you're um, attuned to seeing them. So when one goes past, you go, oh, there's one. No. What literally happens is statistically more red Fiestas are going to appear in front of you, right? Um, they've done experiments with random number generators, where they, um, this, this generator will put out a, a run of um, maybe a thousand ones and zeros, right? And left alone, it will, it will put out roughly 500 ones and roughly 500 zeros. Can I zeros. just stop you for a second, Dave? Exactly yeah. what you're talking about right now. I just talked about our, our affinity with number 33. I'm looking at the digits in the top of the screen. We have 312 people tuned in, which is a three and a one and a two. That's a 33. And then three people have scanned the QR code. So all I'm seeing on the top of the screen is just 333. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, as we're talking about this and you're explaining the mechanics of it's happening, I'm looking up there and I was like, I wonder if there's a 33 up there and it's, and, it's changing. And when, and when you said about 33, you were sitting exactly in the right place so that the, on your T-shirt it just said S33. Uh, it, there, is, there is actually a 33 in the logo we, that we put that there on purpose, yeah. I know, but as the, that moment, you just oh, had right, so the was in the way, so all I saw was R33. <laughs> or S33, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, um, but, but that's what happens if... Um, with these random number generators, right, you get usually half ones and half zeros. But what they did was got a meditator to sit and meditate and, and concentrate on producing more zeros and ones. And they looked at the results and significantly more zeros and ones. But it's not even bound in time. They, what they did um, after that, they, they um, run, you know, set the machine off and, and produce a run of numbers. And they sealed those numbers into an envelope without looking at them. Okay. Ten years later, they got um, a meditator to sit and concentrate on more, making more ones and zeros of a sequence that's already run, you know, ten years ago. So 
he did that and I opened it up and significantly more ones and zeros because there's this thing called uh, this concept called Schrodinger's cat. Um, it's yeah. a quantum physics idea that uh, very quickly uh, imagine a cat, uh, a box um, with uh, a vial of poison in it. And uh, there's a trigger mechanism that is really unreliable. So you don't know if it's going to go off or not. So you put the cat in a box with a poison and shut the lid. Now that cat at that moment is in a uncertain um, situation where it could be or is both alive and dead. And it will stay in that situation until you open the box and look in. Right? Then that uncertainty collapses down into one certainty, one or the other. Okay. Um, so we, we affect it with our expectations. We affect the results with what we, you know, in, in the case of the random number generator, what the meditator is focused on. Um, so all through your life, all through your life, you have Schrodinger's cat moments. So um, every, every day you're making lots and lots of decisions, whether small or big. Um, Let's, let's say um, what you had for breakfast. You had a choice between, um, you know, a banana or cereal, yeah? And for that moment, before you make that choice, right, there's an uncertainty. And then you make the choice and that uncertainty collapses into uh, one or the other. But that moment is, is insignificant. It doesn't affect your life one little bit, right? So imagine on that day, Later on that day, you're going to go down to Tesco's, okay? Um, now, under normal circumstances, you get there at Tesco's, and uh, when I turn up, right, I'm going to Tesco's as well. When I turn up, you're already in Tesco's, your car's parked in the space that I, I normally want, okay? So let's change that situation. Let's imagine that before I set out, I decide I want that car parking space. So... What I'm essentially doing is I'm reaching in to that um, Schrodinger's cat moment in you know earlier on in that day, and affecting that choice that you make. So instead of having um, cereal that day, instead you chose to have a, a banana. So that means you leave the house five minutes earlier because it doesn't take you as long to eat it, and then that means you get to Tesco's five minutes earlier, so that when I turn up, you're just pulling out. What you've just said would indicate or would suggest that all our consciousness is linked. Everything is linked. Yeah, the, the place we're in, the place we're in is a place of mind stuff. It is a, it is a, a construction of a, uh, an infinite mind, right? Holding all the variables of the whole of time and space, right? Um, and, and so it's not like, it's not like... Um, Okay, I said the whole of time and space is, is already done. It's like a, a, a calculation, an algorithm that's living so that it can be tweaked so that um, it wasn't me that changed the, um, from one respect, uh, perspective, it wasn't me that changed your, your mind. It was always, you always had the banana. <laughs> right? um, it was just that because all time and space is in one place, it's all happened. It's all happening all at once. When I'm when I um, decide I want that car parking space, you decide you want to have a banana. This is sort <laughs> of like, sense? yeah, because this, this reminds me of the thing uh, or the the saying when you know a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil. It, that might seem small, but it can cause a chain of events that would cause a hurricane on the other side of the earth. You've, everyone's heard this saying, and it, it sounds quite fantastic, obviously. But essentially, that's the same mechanics of what you just talked about. That yeah. you know, the, all of these micro, what we might call decisions or forks in the road, um, uh, could be much more significant than we believe. And like you say, if it's all linked together, a small decision for one person could create a knock-on effect that frees up that parking space, for example. Right. So it, you mentioned it um, earlier. It's, my, it's actually my favourite analogy. The whole of time and space is like a kaleidoscope. Yeah, so imagine when you look in a kaleidoscope, you see this infinite pattern, right? That's the whole of time and space, right? But what you've got 
in reality is a small kind of segment where there's lots of uh, stars and colored bits of dye and whatever, which form the actual pattern. And then you've got an arrangement of mirrors and you know, reflections and reflections of reflections, and that forms the entirety of, uh, of you know, what we call reality, okay? Um, in, three in three dimensions, we can't change the pattern. The pattern is in the fourth dimension. Uh, all we can all we can do is is literally it's it's deterministic at that we're point. actually only witnessing one aspect of the kaleidoscope not all of the other yeah, possibilities we're just looking at the reflections and the reflections of reflections right but when we go into the fourth dimension right we're using our imagination we actually go into the pattern and we can make a tiny change in that pattern a tiny um like surgical change very precise change and then the whole of reality changes the whole pattern if you make a change in that that little pattern segment well the whole of reality changes around it right um so we're doing this all the time uh, but again we've been you know we've been uh, propagandized and uh, and poisoned and everything so that we don't know that we're doing this and in fact the controllers who do know how it works are, and, and by the way, I don't think they can actually do what we can do. So they need us to actually, uh, you know, um, change reality for their benefit. So that's why they do all these public rituals so that it changes our, our or focuses our mindset where, where they want us to focus. We've said it on day one but, since, on this show since day one that those that, that, that really at the top of the pyramid of control, that the real parasites, they don't have the power of creation at all. We have the power of creation. That's why we've been, we've been uh, ha uh, harnessed and, and, and saddled in, in a way. Uh, and, and, they're and they're actually piggybacking off our creation with their own projected ideas that are used, you know, through the media, trillions of dollars are spent, you know, to project these ideas into us. So it makes absolute sense what you're saying, Dave. Sure. Um, so as I said, we, when we do it, it's a, it's a surgical maneuver. We make a tiny, precise change. And so the ripples are very, very few. So the fact that you had a, a banana uh, for breakfast instead of cereal, the ripples of that are going to be a minuscule, right? I believe that uh, they've created uh, technology to mimic what we can do naturally. Most of the technology out here is, is mimicking what we can do naturally. But I think they've created technology um, in the form of the quantum computer to literally reach back into the past and choose a, a different probability of an event happening or not. Uh, and by bringing that probability into, into this reality, then something else happened instead of what actually happened in our past is, is this what um, is this what created the mandela effect that's what i believe it, it, it is because if you listen to the guy who was behind the quantum computer geordie rose when he's describing that uh, how the how the computer works he says that uh, um when they when they run the quantum computer it literally goes to a parallel universe where what they're Michael. looking for <laughs> that's amazing it just sounds so what cool. they're looking for sorry it sounds so cool like when you say it like that because the computer goes to a parallel universe <laughs> i don't here's the thing i don't think there are parallel universes i think there's only one and um but there there are infinite infinite probabilities so for every moment there's an infinite probability of um, whatever things happen and one of those probabilities collapses into into reality and that's what happened but um i think what they're doing is they're they're going into they're going into uh you know into the past and grabbing a different probability and bring it into this world because that's what geordie rose says he says um we go into a, into a parallel universe and we find the uh the result that we want and we bring it into this universe to make an effect in this world. He doesn't say to get the answer or to compute something. He says to make an effect in this world. So that's what I think they're doing. 
but because it's technology and it's not our natural abilities, where we make a, a really surgical change that doesn't cause very many ripples, they go in with like a blunderbuss and they blast a change in and it causes huge ripples or relatively huge ripples. We and just uh, invaded the past and put an American flag in it, right? <laughs> yeah, or, or, you know, literally all the, all, the, um, all the Mandela effects that we're seeing, which nobody n noticed any of those things, you know, before, um, before that, you know, the, the Mandela thing um, popped up. Um, again, I think it's, it coincides with the, the technology they started using. Um, but as I said, when they make a change, they haven't got that finesse. It's just technology that blasts a, a change in there. And the ripples um, are, are noticeable now. Um, and uh, I've, I've, seen some, I've seen some Mandela effects. I, I literally, there's no way I can explain. Um, I just saw one today. Walker's Crisps. What the flavor uh, switch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is I, one that I was, I was, I was um, talking about. Now, I, I, I did a lot of research into this because, for me, when I grew up, it, it was very simple. I love salt and vinegar, and I absolutely hate cheese and onion. So when my yeah. mum would religiously buy that big multi pack of of Walker's crisps, it had every flavor. At the bottom of the cupboard, it was like a graveyard of cheese and onion crisps, and mm -hmm. I remember it was always green. Yep. Because the and color of an onion is green, and for me, salt and vinegar. Salt comes from the sea. Salt and vinegar, blue. Yeah, yeah. it's obvious. It's obvious to us. Are you, uh, and, Johnny, do you remember? Absolutely. That's exactly how I pictured it. But you know the the color coding. I mean, I remember salt and vinegar. Oh no, sorry, sorry. Ready salted was red. Yeah. Of course. Prawn yeah. cocktail was pink. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Smoky salt and vinegar brown. was blue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was like. It's ingrained in us now. You Those know? are archetypal crisp colours that no one should ever fuck with, Dave. Smoky bacon. <laughs> exactly. What colour so do you something... think smoky bacon is? It's like dark red. Dark red, brown, burgundy? Yeah, yeah. Burgundy. Yeah. I yeah. thought that was a localised micro Nelson then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it makes sense, doesn't it? It makes it sense that we can, you know, you can just look at the packet and, and feel what it is. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so that that's a change that uh, again doesn't make any sense absolutely how can salt and vinegar be green <laughs> just I, I, doesn't make the any crazy sense. thing is when i researched this a number of years ago before i'd really actually heard about the mandela effect funny enough when i first researched it and this was when the internet was quite different it was a number of years ago i actually found something that was talking about why they switched the colors like it was an actual recorded event. Now, anyone that can go and find that now that gets a free rise above t-shirt, because I can't find anything. There was an actual proper article trying to explain it or to basically, yeah, trying to explain why some people were having the, the, this memory. And they were saying that, yeah, they did switch it round. Um, and it was something to do with the fact that all of the cheaper brands that were basically emulating walkers, they had it the switched way round. And what they wanted to do, it, it, was some, it was something to do with other brands. I forget the details, mm. but it didn't make any sense. And now that is nowhere to be seen on the internet. It's either, it's either I'm having a personal micro Nelson or that was literally scrubbed from the internet. I don't know. But you can't find anything about the switch of the, of the flavors now. Well, there's a lot of stuff you won't find on the internet anymore because uh, we're not on the same internet. We were switched from, a, from one inter internet to another um, a few years back. Um, yeah. But... Nobody knew about it. I've heard, um, lot, I've heard a couple of people mention this. I don't really know any details about it. Okay. Well, you know how you would type in HTTP colon slash slash to get to a website? Yeah. Well, um, HTTPS used to be a security protocol, which you had to pay for. Okay? Right. Um, so, you know, if you, if you bought this security package, right, the security protocol, your, your website would be HTTPS and it'd be secured. Um, at one point, um, a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago, um, they switched every website over to HTTPS, right? Yeah. Now, um, I, I was running a website at, this, at that time and my um, provider said, Oh, Dave, um, you've got to use this new control panel to, to make changes to your website. And I forgot. I forgot about it. And I used the old control panel. 
And one day I, I decided to uh, add a couple of pages to my website and I used the control panel, did all the work and, uh, and then went to see it um, live online and nothing showed up, none of the changes showed up. So I went back and, and made some more changes, nothing showed up. And then um, I remembered about the, uh, the new control panel. So I used the new control panel and now all my changes came up. So there were two, literally two versions of my website. Yeah, the one was my, sorry? I was just gonna say, what, what's really interesting now is most browsers, if you do go on a website that isn't on, on the old system, it has big problems and it doesn't it, it won't even let you log on it will do anything to stop you from logging on saying this is not secure warning warning so that old internet yeah. is still there well i think it's been dismantled over the years it might not still be there but um i don't know if you came across some um, um true stream media um and they're they're sort of dive into what uh, google is doing um no no well Okay, so when you went on to Google back in the day, you would uh, do a search and it would say something like, you know, three million results found. Right? And um, especially me in the early days, I would literally go through pages and pages and pages of results. Um, and yes, sure enough, there was millions of results. But what TrueStream Media did, they recently did that and they discovered it, it came up with like, you know, four, three, four million results. They started going down and looking at them and they found that it was actually just 400 results. You know, after about the eighth or ninth page, no more results. <laughs> and just, all the results were mainstream results. Yeah. So we're on a, a very, very restricted version of the internet now. So yeah, no, it's no wonder that uh, the stuff that you used to be able to find, you can't find anymore. Yeah, no wonder at all. So, so yeah, um, so whereas Brian was concentrating on the Mandela effect, to me, Mandela effect is just an effect. You know, it, I'm more concerned with the cause. And I believe the cause is that we have the ability to go into the fourth dimension and make changes. And so does the system now. They don't have to rely on, on making us or moving us in a direction to, to make changes. They can use their technology now to, to dive in there, make a change to a probability and, uh, and, you know, have the effect they want. But because it's not as refined as our ability, it causes large ripples that uh, we start to notice because we, we record our own version of our universe. We have, you know, we, every, every moment you live, you're living, you're recording your universe, which is everything you can perceive in a bubble around you, all right? So, you know, you have your own separate version of reality from your viewpoint. And that doesn't change when, you know, the, um, the you know, history changes. So that's why we're starting to realize that, hang on, that wasn't the case, you know? So um, it's not a, a case of just misremembering. It literally is that your your um, recording of reality doesn't no longer matches up with uh, the collective recording, which would indicate that the collective reality that we're experiencing is much much more fluid, um, and not just interactive and, and malleable. But if the past can change, <laughs> uh, and and then you know fifty percent, thirty percent, whatever it is of, of the population can have this uh, false memory or Mandela effect or whatever it is, then that means then that what the collective consciousness is, is not solid either. Um, yeah, the collective consciousness isn't solid. As I said, the, the, what we call reality uh, is, is uh, like, let's call it a dream in the mind of the most high. Okay. And he's holding it all in one place in like, you know, it's an infinite mind, Like we can imagine, um, like, okay, Charles Dickens, who sits, sits down to write Oliver Twist, he creates a whole world in his head and uh, populates that world with characters and essentially gives them characters free will and writes down what they do. <laughs> uh, and uh, so in his head, he's holding that world that he's created. But that's a limited mind. Imagine what an unlimited mind could do. And do you think it's it's 
you could say that those creators um, and those composers, people like Charles Dickens, Mozart, is the reason that their work lives on and has been popular and recreated so many times because when they went into the fourth dimension to create that, they were particularly powerful at creating their wireframe version before it is that why they've they've created something so cement and so solid in the fourth dimension in that wireframe world that you described that it has persisted and into 3d for hundreds of years for say well yeah imagine if you wanted to be the best at something right and you wanted to come up with the, the best music ever right then that's within your grasp you can literally go into the fourth dimension and say right I, I want this and bring it back into into the third dimension and now you've got the best uh you know but what what mozart and uh, and beethoven called the best back then might not be what we call the best now yeah so um at their level of consciousness they came up with the best that uh, that was back then um but again back then there wasn't um, much to compete with it <laughs> really yeah that, yeah that's that's a good has actually quite a good argument which not a lot of people put forward when you talk about you know the greats back then because apart yeah not many people had the power to have music uh r recorded or at least written down and, and mass distributed back then there was no network for that so that's quite a good point but it's it's a bit more than that because uh again there wasn't any music that would compete with what uh, people like mozart and uh, beethoven would come up with um you imagine a world where it was the music was was very bland it was uh, people you know just plucking notes basically a guy with right. a fiddle <laughs> sat, the, sat there making stuff up as he goes along yeah and then and then somebody like mozart comes along and literally puts together powerful med um, melodies and uh, it, it must have been amazing yeah so do you yeah. think that the ability to do something that was so groundbreaking at the time whether it's in music um, or any type of arts or creation, do you think that could actually be directly link, linked with the, the individual's ability to access the fourth dimension, whether they realise what they're doing or not? Do you think they, that there's probably a positive correlation there? All humans have access to, to this place, and um, but many don't know they, they can do it, and many don't have the confidence to do it. Many look at imagination and dismiss it as nothing, so they don't use it. Um, but anybody who's passionate about something can can use the fourth dimension to create something brand new, because that's essentially what we're here for. We're here to experience this world in in every way that's possible, and you know each one of us is is absolutely unique. Uh, it, we're absolutely unique because uh, essentially only you see through your eyes here and now. So you've got a unique perspective on this in this world, which means that you can come up with things that uh, nobody else is ever going to come up with. Right? You can have thoughts that nobody else will ha ever have. So you can come up with something that has never been seen on this earth before, you know, just because of your uniqueness. And, and that's what we're here to do, to experience everything and, you know, be creative and, 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 and be joyful from that creation. Yeah. Um, when you find what it is you're here to do and you start doing it, right, and, you know, you become the best at it because nobody's ever done it, done it before, right, there's a certain amount of joy to that. I don't know if you've ever seen um, the videos of... Uh, um, there are videos out there of people doing amazing things and they're silly things. So it might be like, uh, you know, doing somersaults over from one building to another or. Yeah. There's or quite a few of those compilations up. about there's some really good ones as well. Yeah. Yeah. But look at the joy of somebody who does something amazing, even though it's silly, but it's amazing. They do it and it's like, yeah, I did it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's pure relation when someone's nailed the first quadruple backflip flip on, on rollerblades exactly. or the four foot ramp or something like that. Yeah. There's, there's the, I guess there's a, a feeling like no other knowing you're the first person to have ever done that for sure. Right. But there's a, there's a bit more to that though. I don't know if you come across uh, Rupert Sheldrake. Yeah. Um, yes. And he's morphic, uh, morphic, uh, morphogenic morphic field. field. Um, 
So if, if you do that uh, triple back somersault, right, that nobody's ever done before, now you make it easier for everybody else to do it because you've made it possible now. Um, that's just what Roger Bannister did. Before Roger Bannister ran the four-minute mile, it was impossible, right? He, do, he does it, and now everyone breaks that record every four years at the Olympics. <laughs> it's, it, this, is, this is a playground we're in, right? And we were, we were given these abilities um, to explore that playground to its fullest. Um, but, and I was talking to, um, as you mentioned, Mark Devlin, who's has been a bit sort of um, down because of looking around and seeing all the, all the horrible stuff in the world. Um, but he was looking, he's looking at a very small, narrow slice of history. You know, when these, uh, these controllers uh, are, in, are in total control now and they've, um, they've suppressed us to the point where, you know, we've forgotten our abilities. So, so yeah, at this point, you can see the world as a very dark and, and, and horrible place. We're only just also, coming out of the worst part of the Kali Yuga. We're only ascending part according to that system. So yeah, you can see it. You can see it that way as well. That uh, that yes, we're going through the cycle, a cycle, and and time is a cycle. So we're going through that. Um, but if you look at the world and see it in a, as a horrible place, you're just seeing a, the small slice of that um, of that uh, I guess 4D object. Yeah, you're seeing the, the the bad part of it perhaps, or the or the, the depressed part. But what's coming next is, you know, something better. And um, even right now, even when, even when you, you look around and you think the world is a, is a really crap place, well, right now I'm looking around, I think it's a pretty, pretty good place. Yeah, but you are in St. Lucia. <laughs> but, but St. Lucia is part of the world. It is, know? it is, which we have to remember. Yes. Um, so no, there's, there's never any, any real need to be um, depressed or, or worried or frightened or anything because um, essentially this world is a game, it's a playground, right? and, um, and you have the power to have any experience you want. Um, though there are barriers that have been put in, in the way, uh, but if you, again, if you know the game and you know what the barriers are, you can start working on um, how to overcome those barriers. Yeah, absolutely, and we uh, and that's a that's an ethos which we always put, talk about on the show is 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 putting your energy into sidestepping out or rising above these barriers or this opposing force that seems to be in our way, rather than putting all your energy in trying to fight it or defeat it, which uh, which may be defeatist in itself because let's face it in a, in a realm uh, that you're describing, a negative force would clearly be there for a reason. If this is part of the cycle. Um, if, if, if you know, we talk about a lot of uh, you know sort of virgin truthers on, on the show and people that are new to this, and they you know we have to beat the the evil ones and we have to go for a utopia. We're much more like thinking this is actually part of the process, and things are probably exactly as they should be. Um, you know, and it's not always going to be like this, but right now this is the way things are, and it's probably the way that things should be. This is, these are the lessons we need to learn. Is that is that the kind of tip you're coming on? Kind of, but um, uh, to go back to what you just said, um, let's say you, you want to oppose war, okay? So you're standing there and saying, no, stop the war, stop the war, you know, stop the fighting, you know, blah, blah, blah. You're standing there with your placard that says stop war, yeah? Yeah. Well, what are you focusing on? You're focusing, focusing on the war. war and fighting. So um, the... The fourth dimension or subconscious or whatever you like to call it doesn't understand English. It doesn't understand French or German, right? What it understands is your focus and your intention. So by saying stop the war, you know, stop the fighting, you're focusing on the war and fighting and strife. So that's what you're going to pull into your universe. And by saying let's stop it, aren't you sort of already admitting that it started? So you're actually sort yeah. of negatively affirming it. I said this about a lot of people that would that were caught in the trap of keep going to the lockdown protest. You know, they they did, went to they didn't go to one or two and move on. They just kept going, holding up signs saying "Stand up, take your freedom back." 
And my biggest criticism was that sign admits that you're already on your knees and you've already given away your freedom because you're saying we need to stand up and we need to take it back. So you're actually negatively affirming what you're trying to oppose. Yeah, well, well, the thing about the uh, the COVID, um, I won't call them protests, they were rallies. Yeah, we yeah. deliberately called them rallies instead of protests because we weren't standing up against anything or we weren't, <clears throat> we weren't begging the government for anything. <clears throat> Excuse me. We we're actually out there to show people that, yes, you can, you can uh, stand up against this. You can say no if you want to. And um, at the beginning, that was very successful. But then it morphed into protests, which don't do anything ever. So yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Well, yeah. That's that's exactly what I'm saying. It, it was great to make a stand at first to go in, you know, make prove a point to say it's okay to be out in public to meet like-minded people. But when, if you're still doing it 18 months later and just waving placards around, expecting to get a change, then that's uh, barking up the wrong tree, in our opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, again, this is uh, this is. This is why this system is so amazing. It's it's a it's a built-in fail-safe, right? So, um, if you if you wanted to do evil against somebody, right, use that power for evil. Well, in order to wish evil on somebody else, you have to focus on it. So, literally, that evil is going to come down on you. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's a, an amazing fail-safe system. Yeah, um, so energy goes where what is it? Energy goes where focus flows. I think I've I think I've got that the wrong way around. Yeah, something like that. Something um, like that. You get the idea. Yeah. So if I if I was thinking nasty, th I, you know, I want the worst thing to happen to you, right? My focus on it will draw it into me, and it will backfire on me. Um, but the controllers figured out a way around that. Um, they figured out uh, by by essentially getting us to agree to it first. They can bypass that. And this is why they have to tell us what they're doing um, and actually have to get our agreement to it by our silence. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just their, their sneaky way of getting around um, that, that uh, you know, the fundamental rule of this, this universe. Um, but if you realize that you can, you can um, uh, affect the world around you, but here's the thing you don't, you can't, it's not no, no. It's not that you're affecting your universe alone. You're affecting your experience. You can actually affect other people's experience. So um, we, we've got a glimpse of that with the, uh, with the um, placebo effect. So we find that the placebo effect works great if the person believes that the, uh, the sugar pill uh, you know, is a powerful new drug that will help them. But if the doctor as well believes that it is, then that effect is multiplied, right? So you can, you know, um, change somebody else's experience. So you can actually help heal somebody by um, focusing on them and uh, and imagining them healed. We did it um, on this show live, Mark. We had one of our viewers was almost died in a very bad fire. Mark Bayerski came on the show and he guided um, a group healing session towards this person who was basically like this, as if they were going to survive. And they miraculously pulled through. And he was absolutely right. convinced um, that, I'll, you know, there might have been two or three hundred people tuned in live doing this with Mark guiding it. And it, it, it was it was moving. And, you know, within, within a week, despite everything the doctor said, he, he pulled through. Yeah, because your, your body right, is designed to restore itself. It's designed to do that. It's designed to, to make itself as new, you know, um, every, every like six, seven years or something. I think it might be earlier, than, uh, sooner than that. But every seven years, your body is completely new, right? So, so essentially, it should be like brand new every seven years, right? But our belief in who we are and what we've experienced and everything literally makes everything that we had seven years ago appear when our body's renewed because we believe that's you know if we've got cancer then we you know and our body's renewed then we it, it, we will rebuild the cancer <laughs> because that's part of us um so your body knows how to heal itself right um you can instruct your body to heal but also you can you can actually um 
help somebody else heal by focusing on 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 them and how you'd focus it on them is uh is it almost it's almost the same way as you'd focus on somebody in the third dimension so um okay in the third dimension if i wanted to speak to you and you were a thousand miles away i would um put pick up a machine and dial a, a very unique number for that corresponds to your number yep. and you know your phone will ring and now i can now we're connected and now i can speak to you All right that's just a metaphor right? in this three-dimensional world it's just a metaphor because we don't have any other metaphor for me being a few thousand miles away to to speak to you um, we're using another metaphor right now. I'm talking to a machine, and uh, those signals are going through undersea cables to your machine, and uh, the sounds coming out of your headphones. So that's another metaphor. No satellites uh, involved. <laughs> no satellites involved. Undersea cables. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get that in there. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, so there is another metaphor, another way of uh, communicating. If we're way, way apart. Um, it, and that's by using the rules of a higher dimension to bypass the rules of this lower dimension. So how that would work is, well, you and me, in the fourth dimension, we're all, again, we're all in that one thing in one place, all of time and space, yeah? We're, so we're together in the, uh, in, in the fourth dimension, right? There's no distance, no space, no, no time. No spatial, spatial separation. No, so we're all together. So I can contact you, speak to you, right, by going into the fourth dimension where we're together and then talking to you directly there, no matter where you are in time and space. So let me ask you, Dave, do you think that people that are genu genuinely telepathic, people that can genuinely remotely view, are they people that have access to the, that have, how should I put it, um, aware and cognitive access to the fourth dimension on demand rather than the regular meat suit operator that just uses the fourth dimension in the background without realizing it does that make sense well we've first of all we've all got um we've all got uh, telepathic abilities right we've all done it we've all seen it happen right um, but again we don't know that we've got them and one of the barriers is belief if you don't believe you've got this ability then you haven't got it <laughs> simple as that right um but this process happens whether you you know it or not. So you know those are times when you're thinking of somebody. I, I haven't oh, I haven't seen John in a long time, and then John rings. <laughs> right? That's you contacting him, connecting with them because you're thinking of them, right? And and they respond. Yeah. So we're using it all the time. But again, your, your level of, of, of consciousness, your belief level has to match. For those, those people who use it um, consciously, and there are people who do use it consciously. Um, I believe the Maasai, um, I'm not sure if they still do, but the Maasai used to, um, okay, somebody would, would go hunting and they'd catch you know, an antelope or something, and he'd send, send the message back that I've caught an antelope. And by the time he got got back to the village, they'd be uh, you know be singing the antelope song, and they'd be you know preparing for the uh, to cook the antelope, right? And it, a very good a very good example is when uh, identical twins. This has been literally documented that um, identical twins, you know, people that literally split <laughs> at a molecular level at conception, can have uh what how should we say communication abilities over time and space they can sense when things happen to each other apart from being able to finish finish each other's sentences stuff like that and so it would make it would make perfect sense that if two people had not only shared a womb but also shared a common um pre-birth source literally coming from the same egg and sperm combination that their connection in the fourth dimension would be a lot stronger for this kind right. of ability that makes perfect but sense but your connection, you can um, start a connection with somebody just by looking at them. <laughs> right? yeah. um, and, and this is how, you know, I mentioned about uh, in the third dimension, you'd, use a, you'd dial somebody's number and you'd connect with them. Well, in the fourth dimension, how you do that in the fourth dimension is, right, you picture them, you visualize them. 
right? So you you think of you think of uh, you know your best friend, right? You visualize them, right? And that makes the connection. It's like you just dialed their number and their their phone's just wrong, right? Um, now that you're connected to them, now you can actually uh, send. Um, images. You don't send words so much. You send images. You send feelings and images, and yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's what gets transmi transmitted. But it's not transmitted because in the fourth dimension, you're both there at the same place. Yeah, it's very uh, interesting. Uh, I've I've had I've had stuff like that. This um, very powerfully um, in dreams, where someone from maybe my past um, has come to speak to me in a dream out of nowhere and it's been very profound and then in the next couple of days i found out they died um and then yeah. and, and what they were saying was sort of like almost like and, and i didn't know in the dream that it was sort of like a little goodbye and stuff like that very very powerful stuff um and you know what you've the mechanics that you've explained and you've explained it very well tonight because some people that talk about the fourth dimension they they, they overcomplicate it i think you've explained it very well tonight but the mechanics that you have explained really just make all this stuff completely make sense. Well, as I said, I it feels like, and I know because of uh, my cannabis journey, I've been I've had to prepare to understand what this is. Um, so I I got um, I essentially got navigating the matrix. Well, one of my earlier talks, um, that was one chunk of information that um, I was ready to understand. And then uh, after I, I'd given that talk a few times, um, I got how the most high created the universe. And it was, it, it seemed obvious to me, <laughs> you know, the, the, the process by which, uh, the, have you, uh, I don't know if you've seen that video. Your, your video? Yeah. I haven't, mate. No. Okay. So um, I, I literally just go through um, the process of how this singular being would, would, what this singular being would do once he is like self-aware, be aware of itself. Now, now what? I'm all there is. There is nothing else. Just me, and I'm just, I'm just I'm, an awareness. I'm everything there is, all, all, all of it, all at once. Yes. So, what, what would you do? What's, what's the most interesting concept for this singular being that is all there is? Well, first thing you'd need to do is, if you wanted to experience something that wasn't you. You'd have to create something that wasn't you, and the other, other than you. Yeah, you yeah. have to create the co even not just create the thing. You'd actually have to create the concept, like the metaphysical barrier that that separates you, which is everything, with something else that isn't you. Now, just thinking about that is that's the whole show in itself. And right. uh, believe me, I thought about this a great deal because um, I've I've had the pleasure of of through spirit molecule experiences to having the feeling that I was right next to knowing what it feels like to be everything all at once. The total loss of self, not just coming out of the meat suit, the, the loss of the concept of what it even is to be a human. And, and people that have done the spirit molecule a lot talk about going to the place where you are everything. There's no heat, no hot, no cold, no up, no down. It's everything all at once. So I know exactly what you're talking about, Dave. Right. Well, um, so yeah, if, if you get the chance, have a have a watch of that one. It's um, literally if you if you think of um, so that singular being might symbolise himself as a point, even though that point is everything there is. So then the other will be another point, a certain distance away. Well, now has created the idea of one dimension. Yeah, so distance away. Yeah, so we've got a point, a certain distance. Okay. What would it look like if that point was this way, you know, a certain that certain distance away, or down here, or there, or there, or there? Then it would explore everywhere that point could be away from, you know, that distance away. So now you've got a circle, okay? So now what? Now he's now he's the, he's aware of all the places that circle that uh, point can be. So now the next thing is, oh, what would I look like from the perspective of other? <laughs> So now you end up drawing two circles. So you've got two circles interlocking. You've got the vesica Pisces. So now you've got another shape. And uh, now you've got the concept of two um, uh, points where you can draw lines between them. And so if you start exploring that, you get, you get all sorts of things, uh, including something called the golden ratio, 
uh, 1.618, which is the basis of all reality here. Yeah. Um, but then you get new points to draw circles around. So you start drawing circles, you end up with the flower of life. Yes. <laughs> um, and in the flower of life, um, al along with two dimensional geometry, you've got three dimensional geometry hinted at. So now from that hint, you can expand that, uh, that flower of life into three dimensions. And now you've essentially got the basis of all reality in, that uh, we see around us in the third dimension. Um, so, so literally in that video, I go through just these logical steps that, uh, you know, a self-aware being would go through. Have you um, ever sampled the, the spirit molecule, Dave? I have, um, but it didn't have very much of an effect on me, to be honest. Was it, was it a drunken ayahuasca or did you do the, the, the pure one where you smoke it? I did DMT and yeah. ayahuasca. Now, um, DMT, uh, ayahuasca, ayahuasca, I had a, um, a I guess a unique experience. Um, so I, yeah, you, you, if you've had it, you know that the first thing you do is throw up. Right? And so I, I threw up more than I had inside me. Um, I think I coughed up a lung as well. Um, so, I, so I was like throwing up and then I felt, I felt it coming on and I leaned back in a chair all of a sudden the lights came up. It was 11 o'clock when I leaned back in a chair and all of a sudden it was six o'clock in the morning and I had no experience of time passing. It was just like, what just happened? Um, wow. And the, uh, the guy running the ceremony said, no, no, Dave, you were walking around, you were talking to some, some entity or whatever, and you, were, you have an experience. I have no memory of it whatsoever. That would um, generally indicate you had a very powerful experience. But if you have zero recall from my, from my experience with this stuff, that means you've, you've had something quite so out there that you just can't either can't hold it, can't compute it, or couldn't bring it back here. Sounds like you really w went went far on that one. I, I actually got the sense more that uh, I was being protected from what I uh, I learned, and um, maybe yeah. My cannabis journey um, sort of uh, cemented that by saying he can't take it all at once. Let's give it to him like a, a chunk at a time so that he can assimilate it before moving on. So um, I think those two were connected and it was telling me that, no, this is a better way for you to, to understand it by if we give you a bit of time. Um, I had DMT. Uh, now, before I had DMT, I had um, s some magic mushrooms, just a weak mushroom tea. And uh, with that, I didn't see very much. I saw the flower of life. So maybe that does play into it. I saw the flower of life um, on a wall in front of me. But most, the, most, the thing I most took note of was I was seeing writing scrolling along the bottom of my vision. Um, and it was uh, these strange characters I've never seen before. Um, well, I and often see so, something like hieroglyphs or some sort of like old It was dead kind language. of like that. It was kind of like that. Um, but then I had DMT um, like a, a year or so later. And... Um, uh, yeah, I was seeing wavy lines and I was seeing things moving um, with sound and stuff. But I started seeing that uh, that writing again, the same writing. And uh, I tried to hang on to a character and I couldn't. Um, but uh, like three or four years later, while I'm researching the Old Testament, I, I watched a video and I saw the writing. And it turned out to be Paleo-Hebrew. I'd never even heard of it. Uh, the, I, I, I recognized all the, all the characters. And so that led me, because uh, obviously at that moment, I needed to find Paleo Hebrew. So that was, uh, uh, that was another synchronicity. But yeah, yeah. yeah, I've seen a video where you talk about Paleo Hebrew. Yeah, that was very interesting. Yeah, but I needed to find that at that very moment. Um, so it, this whole the whole of this 20 year journey that I've been on feels like a scavenger hunt. And I've been, you know, people or the most high has been giving me clues for the next, the next part of the hunt. Yeah. It's yeah, been, it's been the amazing. ultimate Easter egg hunt. Now yeah. I'd like, to, I'd like to rewind a little bit to what you were saying earlier about the power of um, imagination um, and the power of the mind's eye and how that is playing very importantly um, with our access into the fourth dimension as you're explaining it. Now, 
I'm just going to put this subject on the table. It's something we've talked about a lot on the show. What about those that actually don't have the ability? Um, let me explain further. Everyone's heard of the NPC concept, the non-player character. Now, I knew Dave was going to um, incorporate this and, and very synchronistically, this very, I think it's a very good meme, very explanatory. And then it just fell on my lap. It just, it just came out of nowhere. An NPC is an unconscious 3D incarnate that is disconnected from their soul. They have an unconscious hard drive and they do not realize they're in a game. They see only from third dimensional limited perspective, therefore making them a non-player character. After a character that connects back with their soul, they can then wake up out of the illusion and begin to start to procreate as a, as a player inside the holographic simulation and eventually ascend out of the game. Wake up Neo. So there's clear Matrix references. What do you think about that as a, as a quick synopsis for the, for the NPC phenomenon, Dave? Well, I don't, I don't actually go along with it um, as such because uh, um, part of my research was uh, finding out um, finding out about, uh, I don't know if you come across the incubator baby uh, phenomenon. Yes, yes. Right, so uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, out of nowhere... There are, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of babies in incubators and uh, people would go and, uh, you know, it's like a sideshow. People would go and pay money to go and see them. And, um, yeah, no, no explanation where they came from. Uh, they're all premature in, in incubators. So the mothers should have been close by, essentially, but not a word about where the mothers were. Um, so They were linked also the, with the World Fairs, weren't they? So they were, they're actually a show at the World Fairs. Yes. Um, now, it just so happened later on, I, I discovered that um, cloning was invented around about the same time. Yeah. Um, guy called Deech, Deech, I can't remember. But yeah, cloning was invented around about the same time. Um, now, these incubator babies, uh, around about six or seven years later, they became orphans. And all of a sudden, at the same time, all these hundreds of thousands of orphans appeared everywhere. Um, and those orphans uh, in America, uh, there's a phenomenon called orphan trains, where thousands, hundreds of thousands of orphans were transported from New York and, you know, moved around the country to populate all these towns. Yeah, well documented, the orphan trains, yeah. Yeah, but... The same thing that was happening in the UK. Um, so, again, this is the Oliver Twist time, yeah? So there right. was all these orphans everywhere doing these adult jobs, you know, operating heavy machinery and stuff. And um, these orphans were transported uh, to Australia, to Canada, to South Africa, to various other places around the Commonwealth. At the same time, there were these orphans in, in Russia, and uh, these orphans in Russia were transported all around Russia and, and around Europe, all at the same time. So I found, I found out um, not long ago that um, there are people walking around who don't have an inner monologue. So they don't have that voice in, in their head that they can have a conversation with. Yeah. So if I was, um, excuse the solar, solar system, okay. complaining complaining that there's no, not enough sun. Um, so, so if I was listening to you explain something, uh, in my head I'd be going, hmm, that's interesting. Oh, I wonder if that connects to that video I watched the other week. And, oh, I've got to remember to ask him this question. I'd be analysing what you're saying to me in real time. Yeah. If I didn't have that inner monologue, how would I do that? How would I analyse new information? You'd have to be writing everything down. I'd have to write things down in, in real time in front of me, uh, which clearly wouldn't work because you couldn't you couldn't do, draw things out in, in you know quick enough to uh, to actually uh, you know to make sense of it. So imagine if okay, uh, 150 years ago or whatever, they they created a whole load of uh, cloned bodies. Now I imagine they they're pretty good now at creating clones. But what they, if they can create the bodies, maybe the, what they're not creating is the soul, the, the, the player behind the, the body. 
Mate. So what what you are suggesting, and let me just slow you down there. You're suggesting rather than people with actual souls that have been disconnected from them and are running on, let's say, autopilot, you are going along the lines of suggesting that this phenomenon could be describing people that actually don't have souls. Yeah, there's not a character behind it because they were created artificially. Yeah, and what you said about the internal monologue here, that's no like uh, pseudoscience. It's actually well documented now. Here is something I can't, this is from a mainstream source, only 30 to 50 people, uh, percent of people have the internal monologue. Is it really possible for people not to have an internal monologue? Um, this is from 2023. It's only, it, this has only really been talked about in any great detail in the last three or four years from what I can see, or when it, yeah. this has been popular subject. Um, well, and, and I, I th- this definitely adds to what you're saying there, Dave. I just wanna also add aphantasia which I think is very linked with this. Mm-hmm. Um, it, rather than not having an internal monologue, I'm sure you know what this is, Dave, but for people that don't, aphantasia is the inability to visualize things um, in your mind, or they say a, a blind mind's eye. Yeah. So we can't, we can't imagine what that's like, not to have that voice, not to have that inner eye, that, those spiritual eyes to, to visualize something when we, when we close our eyes. Um, but, you know, and but they, they don't know there's anything wrong, right? <laughs> you know, they've got they've got a spirit that allows them to you know operate in this world, but uh, you know, and they they don't understand, they don't think that uh, you know anybody's different from them. Um, and uh, again, from our point of view, we can't imagine what it's like not to have that voice. So, imagine if you go back to the uh, incubator babies. Before the age of seven, um, everything you hear, everything you're told, becomes your absolute reality. Right, so that you're in you're in programming mode, you know, up until the age of seven. Now, after the age of seven, um, your critical thinking skills come in, and uh, now you literally screen everything that comes in. Um, before you actually accept it. So, you know, you're now thinking about what's uh, what's coming in. Now, if you don't have, again, the inner monologue, that, those skills, that skill doesn't, doesn't, you know, materialize. So, essentially, these incubator babies ended up going to um, Jesuit or Catholic schools to be programmed because the only, the only uh, purpose of school is, you know, obey authority. That's what it is. It's, it's just programming to obey authority. So, so you, if they went to Jesuit schools, are we to s- sort of assume that they may have gone in, not necessarily become the elite, but might have gone uh, uh, higher up in the social echelon and become people of, you know, civil servants, government roles? No, no. These these are, I believe, these are the useless eaters that they're talking about. Right, Okay. <laughs> Because they created them. And when I say Jesuit schools, I don't mean elite schools. I mean the, oh. you know, programming schools. You right, know? Sorry, sorry. So you mean mainstream schools that accept the, the peasant Jesuit uh, syllabus that, that, the, yeah, that yes. the Jesuits came up with rather than like school, a Jesu- special Jesuit training, right? It, yeah, all schools, distinction. Were, all schools, you know, came out of church essentially. Right? So, so they set the programming for, you know, the um, Obey Authority program. And, and that's it. Now, now that's set as reality, right? Now they, it can't change. You can't literally um, critically think about things in, in the same way that we can. And, uh, and essentially, that's it. You're, you're set. And that's why um, when you go to a, a, you know, go up to a muggle and you say, you know, don't take the jab. It kills people. And here's this. And, and look at that. Look at these. Here the figures and all that. And it just washes over them because... No, okay, you're the muggle, right? We here at this show at Rise Above, we love to create our own slang to describe what's going on in, in this metaphysical game. And and your own term is muggle. And for anyone yeah. that doesn't get the reference, this is a Harry Potter thing, right? And it, and it, it get correct me if I'm wrong, it's to, used to describe people that don't have the ability to have magic yes. in the Harry Potter reference, right? Mm hmm. Uh, I, I just think it's better than, you know, sheep all, or because that's derogatory. Um, and we were all muggles at one point. Yeah. Um, back to 
the inner voice. I'm just going to, I was researching this a little bit today because I, I, I knew we were going to talk about this, so I'd like to bring something fresh to the table. Have you ever heard the phenomenon of people having a, an alien or a foreign, I don't mean like a space alien, but a foreign outside inner voice come in? Um, I, I have heard in, you know, uh, but I already know what that is because uh, I, I talk about that as well. Well, let me give you this example that I came across today. The late great mystery of the mind, meet the people who have unusual or non-existent inner voices. Now, we've already spe speak to about, spoke about the non-existent inner voice. What's an unusual inner voice? So, really quickly, Claudia, a sailor, a sailor from Litchfield in her late 30s, is not Italian. She's never been to Italy. She's got no Italian friends or family, and she has no idea why a belligerent Italian couple have taken over her inner voice duking it out in Claudia's brain while she sits back and listens. So she actually has a, a, an arguing Italian couple that she actually says is pretty much a bit of a racist stereotype. It's like they're off a Dalmio advert, <laughs> pasta sauce advert, you know, flamboyant, portly, prone to waving their hands around saying Mamma Mia and stuff like that. Um, I've, I just found this utterly bizarre. This article is, is again from a couple of years ago when people started in the mainstream media started talking about this. Have you, have you ever heard of anything like that, Dave? Uh, not that in, in particular, but, um, but here's the thing. Possession is real, okay? Um, there's, it goes back to, again, the story of the Nephilim in the Old Testament. Um, it says when a Nephilim dies, their spirit is, is stuck here. Uh, and uh, you know we we've called them lots of names over the over the millennia, you know ghosts, nature spirits, uh, demons, jinn, yeah, whatever, yeah. Um, now, ordinarily, with a with a you know a, a good human, um, they're good human humans are inaccessible to these spirits. They can't they can't latch on to them. Um, there are other there are other beings they can latch on to and you can actually compromise yourself to allow them to latch on to you right so is that like being like an alcoholic or, or a, yes. a, addicted to harmful drugs that can open up the gateway for hitchhikers as inspector veg one of our uh, affiliates calls it there's there's a reason they're there there's a reason that alcohol is freely available everywhere and and uh, even even the drugs are freely available everywhere yeah and there are, you know, if you if you uh, shame yourself, if you um, compromise yourself in any other way, it's almost, you know. Also, you can invite them in. If you want to invite them in, they'll they'll accept your invitation. Um, and again, these these nephilim, so the you know they're still around today. So over the over the centuries, um, ordinary people that you call you know ordinary. Right? they're Nephilim as well. When they die, their spirits are here. So, you know, a Nephilim couple, a Nephilim descended couple, right, have, have literally probably um, walked into an open doorway and taken, taken residence inside, inside this, uh, this poor woman's head. Wow. On the subject of NPCs, right, we... Um we, like I mentioned at the start of the show, I don't know if you heard, we have a, l a learning portal called um, the Raw Academy. And we're doing a little course called Wisdom of Mushrooms and actually talking about scientifically breaking down how psilocybin mushrooms work and, and how they can be used in different settings, whether it's medicinal, ceremonial, uh, ritual or therapeutic, which are all different approaches. And mm. here's one very, very interesting detail, which, which Tom from Wisdom of Mushrooms brought up, which me and Andy, my co-host, really zoomed in on. There's a part of the brain which psilocybin very, very specifically targets and basically switches off. And it's, and it's quite an important part of the brain. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, Dave. It's called the default mode network. Or no. for short, it, the DMN, demon, funnily enough. Uh. Now... It says here, and these are the mainstream um, definitions, in neuroscience, the default mode network, also known as the, as the DMN, um, or, uh, or anatomically is a medical frontoparental network. No one understands that. What it says here, mm. it's a system of connected brain areas that show increased activity when a person is not focused on what's happening around them. Now, the way that Tom explained this is that 
this is like when you're in autopilot, when you're going about your daily business. Um, you, uh, imagine uh, tracks in the snow that are very deep. If you have a sled and the sled's going forward, it's going straight into those tracks, the deepest mm -hmm. part of uh, least resistance. Now, psilocybin mushrooms, when you get a good dose of them, they completely shut off the default mode network, the autopilot. And that's when the insights and the things like that come. Now, when I heard about this, I instantly thought, what a crazy coincidence that the, that the abbreviation basically is demon. Okay, because if yeah. you think about this the, and, and the way it describes it's working, it actually is almost metaphorically an explanation of way, the way Satan works um, in the Bible as well, which I found really interesting. But I would argue that this DMN, this default mode network, is what we would say NPCs are actually running on. Because this would also um, come into the aspects of the collective consciousness the egregore of accepted, let's say, daily behavior, you know, uh, and let's say, you know, in 2020, everyone's daily behavior that was running on their default mode network that has now been hijacked into the mainstream media. Their daily behavior was, was changed pretty cl quickly with a, with a, um, like a switch of a, a, a button almost. Yeah. So how do you think this um, well, have you heard of this before? And how do you think this could link in with what you, the, the, some of the processes you've just explained? Well, um, I, I, obviously it's not a coincidence, right? The, that they chose those initials, right? It's, the, you know, the, again, they have to tell you what's, what's going on, right? So yeah. they're, they're, they are telling you because they chose those, those letters, right? Um, so... The NPCs are essentially empty vessels, empty vessels. Um, now, uh, I think um, there are some of these uh, entities that can can you know jump into these empty vessels, but the yeah, I guess the run of the mill Nephilim spirits can't do that. I think there's um, there are a few few of these things that can uh, that almost escaped. Actually, now that I come to think of it. Uh, there's somewhere in the Old Testament, uh, and yeah, this has just come to me, where um, the leader of the uh, uh, of the fallen angels asked for a certain number of um, of demons or whatever to be to be um, left uh, on earth at their disposal at his disposal. So was it was it a really big number in the thousands, or was it like a double digits number? I, I have no idea. I'm going to have to uh, read up on that bit because uh, it just it just popped into my head. Um, so I think there are there are sort of uh, uh, more powerful um, more powerful entities than others. And uh, for but for the general ones, they can't they can't literally get a foothold in this world. Um, some can, and they can jump into certain certain people. I, I think there's a push. There's a push, and there's always been a push to create the perfect host body for all these spirits. Um, now, um, back in the uh, the days of Noah, the, those bodies were um, half human. They were, made, they were doing genetic experiments back then. They were creating half human, half animal um, hybrids. Um, and you know. In the mythology, you know, the Greek mythology, which they don't consider as mythology, they consider that their history. In the Greek mythology, you know, we've heard of uh, centaurs and minotaurs and, and satyrs and things like that. Right? They were host bodies for, for Nephilim spirits. And ever since then, they've been trying to produce the, the, the perfect host body. So um, the alien abduction idea yeah obviously there are no aliens it's it's you know these these demonic spirits again um and you know the the crux of these uh abductions is all about reproduction so there's um stories of women uh getting abducted and uh you know then finding themselves pregnant and then they get abducted again and the baby's gone um things like that it's always been about reproduction so um there's this push to create... farming genetic material as well. Yes, because they're, they're trying to, to find the, the perfect host body. Now, um, I've told this story a few times now. Then Hitler, 
um, when you know when he came to power, there was a project called Liebensborn, and what they were doing in this project were um, getting the blondest blue-eyed women and the blondest blue-eyed men, right, and the tallest men, and uh, breeding them together to try and breed out the human and get back to the Nephilim. Because the Nephilim were described in the Book of Enoch as being blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and very pale-skinned. So that's what that's what um, Hitler was doing. He was actually trying to to breed out the human and get back to the Ubermensch, the Superman, the Nephilim. I wonder if that's what Jeffrey Epstein was doing at that massive complex in New Mexico with the genetic breeding program. Did you hear about that? I haven't heard of that. What did you not know? That, 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 yeah, it, this is all over the mainstream media, but it, it got sort of ignored. Jeffrey Epstein had a huge complex in New Mexico, a multi-million pound complex, where he had like dozens of women there as birthing machines. And he was, he was, it was described as he was trying to purify a perfect bloodline. It sounded very uh, Fourth Reich-esque. I'm going to have to look at that. But, um, but yeah, after the war ended, um, you might have heard of Operation Paperclip. Of course, yeah. Well, did you know that Russians had the, the same thing? It was uh, Operation Osiavakim or something like that. Yeah, right? yeah, the Soviets got some of the, uh, the, excellent, the excellent Nazi knowledge and scientists. I believe they got the eugenicists, right? Because uh, America got the rocketry guys and the military intelligence guys. I think um, Russia got the, uh, the eugenicists, the ones who were working on Liebensborn. Um, so where do you think in Russia that these, uh, these Nazi scientists went? Um, I don't know. I would guess that either in Moscow or somewhere to like out in, out Siberia or something like that. Yeah. Well, no, when, when I tell you, Ukraine. Oh, right. I can see where this is going because of course that was just part of the Soviet Union back then. It yeah, wasn't really so, a separate entity. It was just another Soviet state. So yeah. So Is you've it, heard of uh, the neo-Nazis in the Ukraine? Yes, the Azov Battalion. Yeah, something well, that we covered. They weren't they weren't neo-Nazis. They were the actual Nazis. Yeah, yeah they're that's, that's what I went. said. There's nothing neo about them. They're they're just the last remnants of the actual Nazis. Um, yeah, we yeah. we co um yeah we covered this early on when when it, it all kicks off in Ukraine. We did a whole a whole special episode on it. Um, and showed them there with the Black Sun Empire logos clearly in on their on their uniforms and stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, you know breaking down all the symbols and everything. So, um, so did I was doing a bit of research and I, I found out that um, in the UK there are no more um, orphanages, zero, none, right? No yeah. orphanages in America, no orphanages in Canada, no orphanages in uh, in Australia. What, where did all the orphans go? Did they all get adopted? What happened? Yeah, they they actually populated the world. Uh, there was a as a bit of a, the story I left out, um, and it's one that upsets a few people. Right? Shall I go there? Go. No, we, that's that's why we're here, mate. Okay. So in 1751, Benjamin Franklin wrote an essay. It was observations upon the increase of mankind. Okay. And in the last couple of paragraphs, he he lays out what the what uh, you know the the state of the world is, and he said, the whole of Europe is black, the whole of Asia is black, the whole of uh, he literally went through and said the whole world is black, apart from uh, uh, a small group of white people in Saxony in Germany, the white people in England, and the newcomers in America. And he said that is that that is the entire, um, you know, entire amount of white people in the entire world. And when I say white people, I'm talking about a very particular bloodline, you know, the Nephilim about, bloodline. Are you talking when you say that? You're talking particularly about the like the the blonde head, blue eyed. Um, By this time, they they're not all blonde hair, blue eyed because they had to they had to mix with humanity to to actually survive. So they're not all blonde hair, blue eyed, right? Yeah, they're, they're the purest of the Nephilim, but um, but yeah. Is there a link to okay. those who were that were the, those small hats and are claiming heritage in Israel at the moment? Careful. Yes, they're they're <laughs> of the bloodlines too. 
yeah. careful. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'm just going to get some like explosion buttons out in case we say anything a little bit too salty. <laughs> Actually, do you know what? Yeah. We've got the greatest word. We, we just refer to them as the Black Cube Organization. Absolutely. I, I, I think I, that God Vag or God, God for the Mast, I can't pronounce it properly. He came up with that, um, this Flemish creator. And I think that's a really good one because it, it is kind of ignorant to use any of the conceptual words, especially starting with J or any, anything else like that, because it's really much deeper than that about yep. what this um, uh, th th this group of people is. And it's not one just one specific bloodline. It's more complicated than that, too. Yeah, there's, there's 13, 12 or 13 bloodlines in this in this bloodline. So, um, so oh, where was I? Uh, I, forgot, I forgot. You were talking about getting to the purest Nephilim. OK, blood. yeah. So so um, I couldn't find any orphanages. Um, yes. Pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, but I found there's one place with over 750 orphanages. Can you guess where that is? Ukraine. Ukraine. Yes. Right? You, Ukraine is the center of baby production in the world. Yeah, It's the center of child trafficking, which I don't think is, a, is exactly what we think it is. Uh, it's also a center of um, surrogate motherhood. Yeah, So you could pay somebody to carry a baby for you. So it's literally a center of baby, baby production. All right? So I'm suggesting that the Project Liebensborn continued there because they've got a lot of uh, bio labs in Ukraine. Yeah, the old orange dude talks about those quite a lot. And, you know, that's obviously linked with all the Q stuff. Doesn't mean that there aren't bio labs there. Doesn't mean that that's not true just because it's linked with all that other stuff that's that's got some stupid connotations you know i'm just well i don't i don't think the bio labs are there just to make covid or anything i think they're there careful you know, <laughs> that's, that's a spot oh, swear yep, word sorry. right here dave yeah, ex explosion <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't gosh think to... <laughs> <laughs> i don't think it's there for button. for just that i think it's there for this baby production um now um there was a there's a second narrative underneath the uh um, underneath the uh, the war, the Ukraine war. Any ideas what that second narrative is? Is it something to do with what the homeland of a certain, the actual proper homeland of a certain group of people is, is, is not in the Middle East, it's that part of the world, i.e. the no. Khazarian Empire? No, no. The second narrative underneath this war is Ukrainian orphans needing homes in the West. And right, okay, so you're saying that they've got the baby production ready to go, much in the same way that the orphan trains worked. I see. Well, it's already happened. It's already right. happened. Um, at the time, when I did a, a video a year ago, um, over a year ago now, um, called Return of the Nephilim. And uh, at that time, the news stories were, there was one out of, um, of Ireland that said, uh, we were going to originally take 300,000 of these orphans, but we've now decided to take unlimited numbers. The same thing happened in Canada. They're taking unlimited numbers. Same thing happened in America. Well, we same are going thing. through a great reset anyway, aren't we, Dave? So it would make sense. This Didn't this happen well, like the last time there was a great reset? But here's the thing. Um, I think it was Hungary that took something like 1.1 million. Where are all these orphans coming from? Yeah. <laughs> So if they're if they're creating these these nephil these uh, host bodies for nephilim, yeah, uh, and I missed out something as well that's quite interesting. Um, so if they're creating all these nephilim host bodies, they've now distributed them all around the world. Right? So they're they're everywhere now. Um, now the thing I just missed out was that um, during the Gulf War, there was a second narrative that was running under that as well. And that was um, American soldiers looting all the museums, looking yeah, for yeah. biblical artifacts. Ancient Mesopotamian uh, artifacts. Right. And they found what they found. And this was a story that came out in 2003. They found the, the, uh, the, the tomb of Nimrod or Gilgamesh. I've seen he alleged a photos of his corpse. Yes, he was very well preserved. And he was a giant. Are you suggesting okay. those photos that I've seen are real? I believe they are, yeah. He sort of has a blue tinge. 
Mm-hmm. to his flesh right and you know he has, thought, he has been dead for a few thousand years so what do you expect yeah yeah i mean but you know for all intents and purposes it's a massive sarcophagus with what looks like a 12 foot bearded like sort of poseidon character you know like that it yeah. looks like something out of a movie but you know mm-hmm. I, I always assumed it was you know it was photoshopped or, or just some special effects but no, who, no. who's to say um, I reckon they found it because later on they said they they've extracted Nimrod's DNA. Okay. I heard a story about Hillary Clinton being flown into the site to check the DNA samples. Maybe she was seeing how like related she was. I remember someone doing an insane <laughs> dig about this, and we were just enthralled looking at it, thinking about it, Hillary Clinton coming into this like uh, makeshift lab in the middle of a desert in a, in a tent, in a helicopter coming down. Show me the DNA samples. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, well, obviously they know they know the importance because, um, well, okay, so they they got his DNA right now. If you look in the Old Testament, when it talks about uh, Nimrod, it says he became a mighty man, right, suggesting that he was an ordinary bloke, and then all of a sudden he became a mighty man, right. But when you look at the same passage in the Septuagint, it says he became a giant and you know sure enough when you see uh, depictions of uh, Nimrod slash Gilgamesh on the walls of um, I can't remember where it was now but in you'll see this 12 14 foot giant holding a lion like it's a kitty cat yeah yeah, yeah I've seen that a lot yeah something something right. I keep going back to that image so um, the suggestion is that Nimrod or, or Gilgamesh was an ordinary bloke, and then suddenly, for some reason, he just became a giant. Now, we know the connection between the Americans and the Ukrainian bio labs. So I'm suggesting that they took Nimrod's DNA and they added it to this these Hef- Nephilim host bodies so that perhaps, maybe, now that these uh, host bodies are all over the Earth, Maybe there might be a, a signal, maybe from like a, a radio frequency network of the fifth generation. Um, oh, which, a wireless, wireless pentagram. That's what we call it right yeah, here. Yeah, wi- wireless to avoid pentagram. Out. That's a good one. You like that one, yeah? Remember <laughs> yeah. where you heard it first, Dave? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so maybe there'll be a signal and uh, these, these host bodies will become giants. I think it's also connected with CERN because CERN is essentially um, trying to open a gateway from this reality to, I guess, a part of the fourth dimension where these these spirits inhabit some kind of level in that dimension. Um, and, uh, you know, Whoa, so this is deep. <laughs> this CERN is, opens- I'm not sure I've heard this, this something of this depth for, for, for quite a while. Wow. Well, the New Testament is essentially a roadmap. It's got several um, uses, but um, for for this uh, bloodline that's alive today, its uh, its uses a roadmap of what to do, how to how to take over the world, how to uh, you know open the door for for all these Nephilim spirits. And so you're suggesting if they were actually taking samples of this Nimrod DNA and then using it in um in Ukrainian labs what they'd really be doing is making all of those npc meat suits to have the um like the genetic capability to be puppeted by a disembodied spirit which is what we've spoke about the the the, the, these these sort of timeless nephilim to be like a disembodied spirit but they can operate a meat suit when, when they have the compatibility but not not the regular npcs Again, the NPCs. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I forgot. I, I was actually in the middle of uh, explaining something uh, when uh, I, I lost my thread. But what I was saying about um, there very, being very few white people in the world in 1751, right? The um, the orphan train, the uh, not orphan trains, the uh, babies in incubators, right, were a repopulation event. So there were there were no black orphans zero black orphans so literally these orphans these these clones these you know babies in incubators were then when they became orphans they were shipped around america and all around the world and then all of a sudden less than 100 years 
from when um, Benjamin Franklin said there was literally only a small pocket of uh, white people around. All of a sudden, there's millions of white people around. This is um, something very well documented by a channel called Mind Unveiled. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yes. Yeah, I've, I've started seeing his stuff. They've yeah. done some really good work on this document, like the early postcards and actual, you know, depictions and, and artistic representations of uh, of the of the the, the the Cabbage Patch Babies and you know the in the incubators and what was, and how it was presented to the public at the time. All of it suggests that these uh, these babies were created, not born, uh, because uh, you know they were treated like like uh, commodities. Yeah. Um, so you could buy you could buy children, you know, and like, people were posting children, uh, you know, to to families and whatever. Um, so yes, it was a repopulation event. But you've got these NPCs who are what I believe um, the elite, so-called elite, are calling the non-useless uh, uh, eaters. Yeah, but then you've got a special type of NPC, which are the the um, Nephilim host bodies. Like an elite NPC. Well, yes, uh, they're empty vessels, but they're uh, as close as they can get to the DNA of, um, of a, a, a Nephilim. So that when CERN opens the, uh, the gateway to this world, right, these Nephilim spirits will find their host bodies waiting for them. Here is your new avatar. Select your avatar. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. This is the menu. Um, yeah, that's that's what I think is going on because you know, um, otherwise this world doesn't make sense. All the stuff that's going on in this world doesn't make sense. But when you when you um, think that there's a book, we've been given a book that gives you all the answers if you really look into that book. Um, um, and yeah, uh, we're meant to find out so that we can beat them. Um, and we do beat them in the end. The book tells you that we, we win in the end. Um, yeah. There's going to be a lot of casualties, but we win in the end. It's all wraps up. It's all wraps up in the end. Now, I was going to, uh, I was going to ask you in one of, uh, one of my questions, what you think about the emergence of AI? Are you really worried or cautious or warning people about mucking around with stuff like chat GBT and AI image creation. And then lo and behold, I went on to Telegram, Dave, and I've got this thing on Telegram called Chat GPT Uncensored that just appeared on my Telegram. I didn't sign up to it. And for anyone who knows, Chat GPT is quite controlled. There's lots of, you can't, there's all these woke filters on it. It, won't, it will hardly tell you anything. But on this Chat GPT Uncensored, it's totally uncensored. It will tell you anything. I logged on, and the first thing I saw was this. It was yourself asking for it to create a picture of Kate Middleton dressed as Waldo or a, a more UK uh, centric reference would be Where's Wally, right? Um, so that sort of answers my question. You're not phased by these gimmicky uh, image creation apps uh, the, and this AI that's being presented to us at the moment. A lot of people are really getting warnings to people not to use it. What yeah, well, here's the thing. Right. We're being fooled by, by this AI idea, okay? Um, now, I used to be a computer programmer, and um, I've, been, I've been focused on AI for, um, you know, for the whole of my career, essentially. Um, so back in the day, I used to um, test the uh, chatbots because, uh, you know, the idea of AI has been around for a while, and uh, the chatbots have been a while for, around for a while. Um, the chatbots haven't really advanced that much because <laughs> um, I used to do what's known as a Turing test. So I'd start talking to these chatbots and if I, you know, could be fooled to believing in that it's a human, you know, behind it, then, you know, it would pass the Turing test. Um, so I started talking to these new, you know, chat GPT and I, I tricked it up. I tripped it up and I'm, it didn't pass the Turing test as far as I was concerned. Yes, it's got more, it's got cleverer as a, as a language manipulation tool, right? Um, but it's not, it's not uh, artificial intelligence. There's no way you can actually put enough um, transistors together to get actual intelligence. I think we're being set up. I, I think, um, if, again, if you listen to... Uh, Geordie Rose talk about the software 
that's going to be running on these uh, quantum computers and listen to how he describes it. What I think is actually happening is that, um, you know, these quantum computers are more of um, an antenna. They're not, they're not actually, uh, it's not actually computing anything. Yeah, it can do what I was saying about diving into uh, the fourth dimension, but it's more of an antenna for a consciousness. So literally a consciousness that's linked to the internet so that this consciousness will have uh, access to the sum of human experience, plus when they make the internet of things, so that everything, every blade of grass has a, has a Mac ID, um, it'll have control over everything. Could it be said that what they're trying to tap into is like the Akashic record? Well, that, you know, the fourth dimension is what you'd call the Akashic records, the whole of time and space in one thing yeah, and one object. So that, really, if, if they're using outside extra meat suit technology that's made of microchips and circuit boards and eventually implanted into us to be able to access the Akashic record, something that we should actually be doing anyway. Right. There's only one re yeah, there's a, yeah, but you could argue that many of us have had our ability to access it, access it at will um, and bring the information back seriously hampered, right? So if you're putting in a, a technological interface to, to complete that task, which you should be able to do yourself anyway, the only reason for that is to is like to implement like um, a tax on it or some sort of control or you know to to piggyback off it because we should be able to access that stuff and, and bring the information back as we wish anyway, shouldn't we? Well, transhumanism isn't to benefit us. Right? Yeah. I think um, what transhuman humanism um, as it pertains to us is them uploading our 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 spirit as it were up to into their technology so they can destroy our bodies but we're we continue on inside a computer or maybe a what, maybe a nephilim will be loaded into our empty meat suit when we're uploaded well again i think the, if you remember that the uh, the goal of this uh, this bloodline is extermination uh, they want to exterminate us all um but i think you know one of the things they want to do is uh, is upload our spirits into their technology because again new, new testament is a is a roadmap right a roadmap for what they want to have happen so uh, believe it's in revelation where they say that people will want to die but will be unable to so if you if your uh, your consciousness has been uploaded to technology right, and your body's dead but you survive you know, within a computer, there's no way you can die <laughs> unless they want you to die. <laughs> so, so that would be that would be like torment forever, wouldn't it? Yeah, I've heard that analogy made before. Um, yeah, Un unable to die in, in an everlasting digital hell. Yeah. So the uh, the transhumanism isn't for us. They're not going to be implanting stuff into us to to enhance us. Yeah, that that's the idea that they have for themselves. But, um, you know, our experience of it will be to be uploaded into their, their software or into their digital world so that, uh, you know, that's it. That's, that's our lives ended as such. Um, but we continue on, you know. So, um, but again, I don't think that's, it's going to work because the story's already been written and, uh, you know, they lose. Um, and I'm seeing it happening already. I, I think that the upper echelons of this um, agenda, this agenda, they're dying. Or they're dying off. They've been they've been dying off for, for for years. You know, the Queen died at least four years before they announced it. Philip was dead long uh, long before they announced it. I think Kate and William they're dead as well. Um, and right now you've got body doubles and uh, CGI. Get you know. Um, Very interesting. That you've mentioned that right because that's an a, an amazing segue. Right, so what I was actually going to talk about um, potentially after after you'd popped off, if you if you didn't have any more time, so I might as well mention it now. Right, we we started talking about this two weeks ago, and normally I don't really comment on like what the, what's happening with the royals because I find it a little bit low brow because there's obviously a bit of peasant pantomime aspect to the 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 um, coverage of what's going on with the Saxe Coburg Goffer clan. 
but obviously in the last couple of weeks there has been quite a lot of stuff king charles diagnosed with cancer kate middleton operated for serious condition uh, we'll speak about her in a sec sarah ferguson diagnosed with skin cancer king of norway rushed to hospital with infection during holiday in malaysia prince william pulls out a memorial memorial service prince edward takes a break from royal duties etc etc um obviously we had the king of the um city of london jacob rothschild he died last week allegedly i had a bit of a personal mandela effect i thought he was already dead maybe that's no there was another rothschild. rothschild that died a few years ago was that evelyn de rothschild yes right, evelyn okay rothschild. that's it that's it yeah. now th this 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 theme of um the upper echelons of the the uh let's say the royal sector of the black cube organization there's been more of it. William's last minute cancellation sparks fresh royal health panic. This is uh, 27th of February in the last couple of weeks. And this guy who was married into the Windsors, he actually did die of a traumatic head wound and a gun was found near the body. So that's definitely suspicious circumstances. That's Prince Michael's son-in-law. Um, seemed to have potentially been bumped off. Uh, so, in, in, in a nutshell, the Princess of Wales is missing and a spa the spare prince is in exile and the king is getting treated for cancer with herbs. If this was the 1300, France would be looking to invade. I thought that was, I thought that was quite funny, but it doesn't seem like they're, they're, um, their infrastructure is in a good way at the moment, if, if this isn't all just a pantomime. I, I'm, I'm telling you, they're, they're dead. Um, Charlie Sausage Fingers isn't, isn't Charles... He's not Charles. You know, there looks like there's like four or five body doubles for him because, you know, the, he's, he's not the guy. And um, I, I saw a picture of, uh, of William from, uh, you know, taken like in profile. And, you know, this William has a, has a hooked nose, whereas, uh, you know, the younger William didn't. Now, yeah, you I've notice, yes, yep. it grows, but it doesn't change shape. Not like yeah, you that. can't completely change the shape of your nose. Even if you get punched and the, the nose has been broken, it doesn't change the, the profile of the nose in, in that way. Right. So he's not the guy, the one that's, uh, you know, the bald headed guy who's walking. Around. That's not the guy. It's it's somebody else. It's a body double. Um, as I said, the the upper echelons are dying off. OK, um, now we've still got the middle management. Right. And, uh, you know, the, the henchmen still trying to push the, the, you know, the agenda. But, you know, when they, they call upstairs for guidance to do, you know, for what's next, nothing's coming back. So, so that's why, you know, this, the wheels have been falling off their, their plan over the last couple of years. Because at, at the beginning of the, the whole pandemic thing, well, you know, if they'd carried on, they'd have they'd pretty much almost got everybody. You know, if they carried on with the with the pressure that they were piling on everyone, right, and then the uh, you know the the uh, penalties and uh, and th for for anybody who didn't go along with it, right, if they carried on in that vein, then you know everyone would have got the got the jab, and those who didn't would probably be dead now. Yeah, if they carried on, they would have they would have probably succeeded, but you know a little way into it, they stopped. <laughs> And they didn't continue, and uh, and and now they're like, okay, what do we do next? And oh, uh, let's let's have another pandemic, <laughs> but it's not going to work. And you know, so you know, they they've been trying to push another pandemic with with uh, you know scary scariants, and uh, and now with this this disease X, which it's not it's not catching, it's not working. Um, even the the climate change narrative is falling apart. So, so no, it's not going to work out for them. And you know, it's already that's already been predicted in the uh, in the book. So, what do you think's next on the cards? Uh, again, we're we're watching um, we're watching a scramble, a scramble to to get something that works. Um, I, I think the very last option is the alien invasion. You know, which I'm <laughs> I'm waiting for. I can't wait for that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> kind of been put on the back burner isn't it it's then... it's going to be scary but it's going to be funny i think you know because uh i think so many people are aware of it uh when it actually comes it's 
you know we, we're gonna we're gonna see it more like a a, a silly b movie you know yeah yeah agreed it's um like you say it's been on the cards for quite some years people have been talking about it for the last 10 15 years you know and uh the, the snippets of it and then it you know and then it kind of disappears or something they, t they try and push something else and uh, like you say it just seems like they're just scrambling around trying to you know capture capture the the, the attention of the people and distract them as they always always have done well you've got to remember that these people now are not the ones who put this system together they're just implementing it and uh, and uh, a lot of them um Here's a, here's a problem with the Nephilim, okay? So in order to survive in this world, they have to mix of humanity. And, you know, for the most part, they try not to, but they still have to mix with humanity. And, you know, some of humanity literally ends up rubbing off on on, on them. So, you know, the, the children that are born to them, they uh, some of them aren't psychopaths. So they have to turn them into psychopaths, you know. Yeah. So they send them into these elite schools, and and you know, they get encountered. Yeah, they get they get buggered, and they get you know, have all the all the uh, trauma based mind control, and then they become as psych psychopathic as their parents. Mm. So, but they're not they're not natural psychopaths. So you know, they literally have to be um, uh, you know, bullied into into being like this. So. Um, so they haven't got the the full kind of impetus to make this thing happen. Do you think right? that that could have happened like over the centuries and over the millennia? Their their bloodlines have got diluted, therefore they're not all like reincarnate with full psychopathic, no empathy abilities here to do the job. Farmer class of mankind. Do you, do you think that that we've got to the stage now in you know this plan is obviously hundreds or thousands of years into its fruition that because they've mingled, like you say, they've mingled with mankind so much that, that, that they've got a certain level of inertia with, with, with humanity. Well, I, I think, um, we know of, um, how it was before, before when they tried to, to exclusively keep their bloodline pure. Well, you had stories of, um, like Vlad the Impaler, for instance. Yeah who could only survive here, really, by drinking human blood. Um, so they, they wouldn't go out because the sunlight would, uh, would actually harm them. Um, so the stories of vampires, you know, yep. there's, there's truth to that. Yeah, actually, so, to pr Prince Sausage Fingers is directly related to Vlad, Dr Vlad, the Imper Vlad Dracul, the actual yeah. Count Dracula. Yeah, and he's very proud of it as well. Most very about it in the it. Daily Mail uh, once every th about three years talking about his big tracts of land in Transylvania. He's mm -hmm. direct, you know, directly uh, related to the dragon, as he, as he refers to it. But the thing is, uh, the more they keep, they try and keep their bloodline pure, uh, the more uh, madness and uh, genetic, you know, um, you know, instability that gets, you know, uh, occurs. So they have to, they have to have an infusion of human blood into their bloodline. And so they use, again, their, the the lesser bloodlines so the the what they would call the mud bloods yeah um so you know that's an infusion of human dna and that human dna comes with other things like uh you know empathy and uh, people have uh, argued that that's what diana was brought in for to to keep the the human element within that bloodline with that so it didn't go full black cube organization reptoid <laughs> um yeah or, you know, I mean, or, or just have web fingers like regular inbred people. Well, I don't know. Did you know that um, the Queen had two two sisters that they yes. they chucked away in a in, in mental hospitals and stuff? One of those like they, uh, Mother Teresa mental hospitals as well, where they don't properly look after you. You just sit there banging your head against the wall. Yeah, that was um, was it um, Kath Catherine Kathleen or something? Um, Bose Lion. Um, yeah, yeah, something yeah, just, like that left her to rot in this mental institution because because that that's what happens when you you inbreed so yes they they have to have to sort of uh, you know um get humanity involved and uh, again that human um element um dilutes their their bloodline and dilutes their you know the psychopathy and some of the other traits 
So, so yeah, um, the the people that are running this aren't don't have the same, you know, um, fire for doing what they're doing. And uh, again, that's that's partially why the wheels are falling off their agenda. So rather than some people who are looking at this um, uh, very closely every day and, and it's sort of still obsessed with every new happening and every new sign-up and a, a bit of doom-mongering is going on, you're actually feeling fairly positive that maybe we, we, have, we seen the, have we seen the worst of, of what's going on yet or is the worst still to come that, that, that is followed by the be that something better? Uh, well, I believe the worst is still to come. I mean, yeah. you know, um, without... without um, you know, um, alarming the senses, um, you know, we're, we're still going to see the massive die off of, um, you know, people that have been poisoned. Um, and, you know, that's in our future. Obviously, we know that. Um, sure. And I think there are going to be some uh, amazing events um, coming up in the next few years. Um, so, yeah, we've. I think we've got some uh, we've got some uh, some incredible things um, on the horizon. Um, but if you are righteous, let's put it that way. If you're um, one of the righteous ones, all you need to do is have enough popcorn to see you through. I love that. What hey, hey, there's one event particularly I want to ask you about quickly. It's something that I've mentioned over the last sort of month or two on this show, just because many people are making these sort of like, I call them info memes. They're not memes, they're sort of like graphics with, you know, b biblical verses, maybe some gematria on. And it's to do with this eclipse that's going to happen on in April, um, which is, I believe, mirrored in this sort of cross with an eclipse um, that happened in 2017. And it's all to do with the United States. You know, I know you know what I'm talking about, Dave. Now, from what I've seen, there are these very strange anomalies um, apart from them being 6,000 6, weeks or six, there's a 666 in between the dates, These, um, the path of the eclipse is passing over um, something like 12 different places called Nineveh, uh, which is in the, in the Bible. Is this eclipse really as significant as people are talking about, um, in your opinion, from what you've seen? I think, it, I think it is. I mean, I made a video back in 2018 just uh, or was it it might have actually been in 2017 uh, just after this eclipse the first eclipse um and i'm i've nailed my colors to the wall actually and as i've said that this is a sign um as a precursor to the end of america america will disappear um so that first eclipse actually went through seven places called salem Yes, uh, in is, 2017 it was Salem, and, and this time it's Nineveh. That's right, yeah. Ah, but it it went through. Uh, this next one coming up on April 8th is going through uh, eight places called Salem, as well as Nineveh. Wow. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. The, uh, sorry. I, you, you, obviously, you, you you're deeper into this one than me. I've I've only seen a couple of info memes, which I found pretty outstanding. Right. So, right. what's the so significance of Salem, that's, mate? That's, that's saying that uh, it's linked to that first one. What's right? the there's been another of Salem, one that, do you think? Well, it means Jerusalem. It's short for Jerusalem. Wow, okay. So the first eclipse it, uh, happened on August 21st, um, 2017. August 21st was the date the first slaves arrived in America. Okay. Um, that was there, August 21st, 1619. Two years later was the end of the 400 years of slavery and affliction that was pro that was uh, um, prophesied in the Old Testament. Okay. Um, and as soon as that, that date happened, all hell broke loose. Um, there are all these amazing weather events that are happening all over the world, like locusts were appearing in places that never saw locusts before. Uh, rivers turned red. You know, half of America was on fire. The other half was underwater. Um, all these things happened, and then seven months later after after the eclipse lockdown <laughs> so the end of slavery then lockdown right um so seven years on from that eclipse is the one on april 8th um now an eclipse was a sign it was always a bad sign a bad omen right? if you saw an eclipse a thousand years ago you'd run um so it's a warning 
about something. Now, the, the book of Second Esdras, one of the books they took out of the Old Testament, tells you of um, what happens in the last days. And it talks about um, the world being overspread by a three-headed eagle. Okay? So that might sound all poetic and stuff, but when you realize that the eagle is a bloodline, it's the bloodline we're talking about, okay? So it's saying this bloodline will have three power centers. So this bloodline absolutely does have three power centers. And those power centers are Vatican City, right. City of London, London. and Washington, D.C. Yeah. Right? Center of religious control, center of financial control, center of military control. Right? So Second Ezra said that uh, this three-headed eagle, right, the middle head, the one that's uh, the most powerful and the one that holds the whole earth in fear, I'm going to say that's America, it said the middle head is going to disappear without a fight. Right? So... Um, I'm equating that, um, that America is going to literally uh, disappear under a natural disaster. And I think that natural disaster is a volcano, a super volcano is going to erupt. Because the X of the where the two paths, the, the, the fulcrum where these two uh, eclipses meet is right on a particular spot, right? Yep, it's over... It's called the New Madrid Fault Line, the most active earthquake zone in America. Is that linked and to Yellowstone? Linked to Yellowstone. Of and if course. you look at the path <laughs> oh, of the yeah. first yeah. eclipse, it literally wow. went over the Yellowstone Fault Line and then over the New Madrid Fault Line. So and it's also, telling you, linked. People, not many, I, I don't, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is true. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is not any normal eclipse. This is a full solar eclipse that could last, that lasts for a very long time. Uh, and, 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 and and people were saying it is the end of um, some sort of a larger solar cycle that's at least 50 years or, or 77 years, something like that. Um, someone was saying that this eclipse could last for, is lasting for longer than 24 hours. I've read about this. I, I don't know if that's true. But here's I, don't, something, I don't think. Here's something interesting, so. Dave. I, 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 I thought that, that there's no way that can be true. Someone was, so, well, here's another one. The date is the 8th of the fourth which can be seen as 408 now 408 as you know is, is means computer error 408 mm -hmm. is the code when the when the screen goes blue and people are postulating that this could be the uh the cyber attack event where you know america's uh, electric infrastructure is fried which i guess could happen if if uh if yellowstone went up right well um okay so i <clears throat> okay I always thought that the second the second eclipse just was the uh, was the final warning for um, for when Yellowstone would go up later on some point right, after okay. that, right? But I uh, I was given a bit more given a bit of information by somebody um, which changed my mind a bit or um, or gave me a second um, a second meaning for the second eclipse. So the information somebody gave me was that the new moon that's written in the Old Testament, so wherever it says the new moon, right, we, we consider that the, when the moon disappears, okay? So the moon goes dark, and we call that the new moon. Well, what somebody told me was, no, right, the new moon in the Old Testament means the full moon, which makes sense now because, you know, something isn't new when it disappears it's when it goes full again that's when it's renewed um so i checked it with um, looking at the hebrew and stuff and it suggests again that uh, there's been a bit of jiggery pokery done in the translation and indeed the new moon written in the old testament is the full moon so you actually in the old testament you take the full moon now, the, 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 the beginning of the year would be the first new moon after the, uh, the spring uh, equinox, right? So um, the spring equinox this year is March 20th, right. right? The first full moon after March 20th is March 24th. 
So that would be the beginning of the year, right? According to um, according to the Old Testament, yeah. right? So at the beginning of the year, there is a festival that uh, that uh, the Hebrews are supposed to observe, and it's called um, Passover. So what you do is you count from the beginning of the year, you count fourteen days, right? And then the next day, according to the Old Testament. Um, when the Hebrews were in Israel, uh, not Israel, in Egypt, that next day is a day they left. They went on their exodus. Okay. So there, before America disappears, there has to be a second exodus. So when you count 14 days from the, the new year, right, it works out to be April 7th. The, and the, the next day, day that, yeah. is a day when not only the eclipse is according to the old testament it's a day that the second exodus should happen so mm. we might see um again i i can't i i've nailed my colors to the wall now and then i've said well the signs tell me that this is what's going to happen but you know I'm, April actually 8th, convi I'm convinced i've seen a thread that's talking exact about exactly what you just said an exodus but they linked it with um uh, a migrant, what was it word like a a, a bat, like a flotilla of migrants coming over the southern border, and they're saying that oh, there's going to be there's going to be an event after the eclipse which will cause a migration of um you know another a, one of those massive groups of people waiting to come over the border that Trump was going on about, and they were linking it to that. There are so many theories that people are talking about. Um, it's uh, that's the reason I've brought it up because it seems like there's a huge build up build up of energy to this to this event which is now only a few weeks away well um the migrant thing it seems to be about replacing the black people there um so that might be something that might happen that uh, they're not needed anymore uh oh so i've just seen in the chat somebody said hebrew is not the original language aramaic is no it's not <laughs> aramaic is, aramaic is babylonian uh, and so babylonian came after uh, you know after hebrew Right, because uh, Aramaic came in after the uh, uh, the Tower of Babel incident. So no, um, you just got corrected yeah. in real time by allegedly Dave. Would you know about that? <laughs> yeah. So, oh yeah, I, I think I think that uh, it's possible that the second Exodus will happen um, uh, April eighth, um, and uh, I was trying to figure out when the uh, end of America might be. Right. Um, so I decided to do something. I read a, I read a book by somebody called Greg Braden. I don't know if you come across. Yeah, I know him. Greg Braden. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he was talking about um, he was talking about using the uh, the golden ratio to um, you know to look at. It. I think the book was called Fractal Time. So um, time is a fractal process. So you know you can predict when things are going to happen using you know it's like fractal resonance so he he used his birthday to um to figure out uh, a, a particular uh, prediction he made so i thought i'd use the same thing so i thought okay let me let me see um try and find the last um, major calamity that america suffered so i chose 9 11. so i took my birthday uh, you know, the age I was at 9-11, right, which was 38. And, um, and what I did was I multiplied that by 0.618 or 1.618, yeah, to get the age I would be when the next calamity happened. No way. Right? Which worked out, um, it was uh, 61, which is what I am at the moment. Okay. So... Um, I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to do. I'm going to try and be very, very accurate now with this. Okay, so I I sort of worked it out as accurately as I could. And guess what date I got? I got the date wrong, but guess what date I got when I when I tried to do it very, very accurately? Was it April the eighth? No, August twenty first. So the anniversary. Of the first slaves touching down in America, right, and this is the the anniversary of that first eclipse. Um, but this it, year, twenty twenty four, twenty twenty four, um, August twenty first. Will the Olympics be going on on that date? 
One, another guest we've had on the show, Jason from Archaics, has, has, has said that he believes there's going to be a Black Swan event this year, 2020. He uses very similar methods, isometric projections um, from past events. Um, and he, he believes that there's going to be some sort of Black Swan event this year, 2024, at the Olympics. I wonder, right. I can't remember what month that is. Is the is the Olympics that late in the year or is it earlier in the summer, sort of June, July? I think it will still be on on August 21st, won't it? Um, I believe it Because it's over the summer, isn't it? Can it, we have we've got we must have archaic viewers in the chat if anyone can sort of um correct my details there on on, on jason's prediction it's quite interesting but, but the thing is i mean that process that uh, greg braden used in his book i don't think it you know i don't think it's accurate because you know if um if somebody else did it with a different birthday um and they did the same calculation they would get a different date right? and uh, but i think it's a synchronicity it was a message for me, yeah. So I used my birthday when I was, uh, you know, my age at nine uh, eleven, and I got the calculation wrong. Right? Um, I didn't take into account the difference between my birthday and the date September eleventh, right? But by me making that mistake, I just so happened to get that particular date, <laughs> which uh, tells me there's a synchronicity going on. Yeah, nothing, nothing is by mistake when when stuff like no. that happens. Yeah, so, so yeah, that's why when I said earlier that uh, we're going to see some amazing events, I think uh, the uh, destruction and uh, you know the fact that uh, America is going to just suddenly disappear might be one of those events. Yeah, which of course, um, realistically, is going to have a knock-on effect around the whole world because that will, but by de facto, mean the collapse of the dollar which for anyone that follows um, global financial geopolitics, they know that that is already well overdue. People have been talking about that for, you know, 20 or 30 years, that the, the dollar is on the brink of collapse. All we need is one more really expensive event and it's going to go. But then, you know, we have these black swan events and the inertia of the system. And a lot of times, very, very well documented, it's actually the black market, things like uh, the drug trade and stuff like that with the cash flow that actually keeps the economy going in these times of either... Um, an economic collapse um, or things like the pandemic and stuff like that you know so they haven't managed to crash it yet but it seems like they've been trying to do it for a long time that's sort of what I'm getting at right and uh, the the Old Testament says that all the merchants will be mourning because uh, there'll be nobody to buy their buy their wares anymore um, so so it does seem like it you know is talking about America and uh, I think we all feel it. I think we all feel that America isn't going to be around for very, very much longer. But it you seems know, it's pretty a steady people, decline, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people are seeing it as, uh, you know, it loses its place in the world. But, um, you know, I think, I think we all get this feeling that it's not going to be, it's not going to be around very much longer. Um, and I think, you know, this, you know, they have a super volcano underneath Yellowstone. And... Uh, you know, um, in one of my videos, I show the graphic of, of you know, it was on the, I think a weather report, and it literally had the you know the American map and literally the whole of America you know in flames. Wow. You know, so so yeah, I I think people already know what's coming, but uh, well, even if, if it's you, on a subconscious level. If you look at the Hollywood predictive programming, uh, um, and and you look at the general. Um, sort of average median theme for science fiction futuristic films the the po post apocalyptic view of america is such a default um narrative for the genre it, it almost goes without saying now oh great another post post apocalyptic film set in america after the great fall of america this is what it's going to be like how many films are there like that 25 50 there are hundreds and hundreds of those films well, think about the very specific one, um, 2012, that film, yeah? It was literally, uh, part of it was set in Yellowstone, where Yellowstone exploded, and... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, the, the, yes, I think, it's, I think there's a subconscious um, understanding, you know, because uh, part of uh, accessing the, the fourth dimension is that we do have access to the future, yeah, because the future is is right there so um 
you know, we can access the future. And uh, so we can have a subconscious um, understanding of what's coming, even if it's not a conscious one. Yeah, absolutely. And we've all, anyone that's tuned in properly has experienced little moments like that where you think of someone they call, your, your phone's ringing without knowing the screen. I know who it is. Yeah, that's them. Those deja vu moments, that's, um, you know, that's how we explain this kind of stuff. Well, yeah, that does explain deja vu because, um, uh, again, I had a, I had a um, cannabis journey that showed me that's how it works. Um, it showed me that um, I was standing in the center, a nexus of like a, a tree, uh, a tree in its roots. That's the best way I could describe it. So in front of me were, was the uh, branches of this tree of all the possible futures in front of me. And I could choose whatever one I wanted. And behind me was all the, the different branches of the past. And I could choose whichever one of those I wanted. Um, and when I looked at um, what we, you know, a particular branch, I would see the events so, you know, that would go on from that, from that choice. And then as I went further, it would fade out um, because uh, then other, other factors would, would come. And so the uh, outcome was undefined. So I could go down and see, uh, have a glimpse of, uh, of each future. Um, so I could choose which one I wanted. Damn, I need uh, some of this oil. Where, where did you get the oil from, <laughs> David? It sounds pretty good. <laughs> well, um, I, at one point I was going to call myself uh, drug resistant Dave because uh, drugs didn't work on me. As I said, with uh, ayahuasca, nothing. Um, DMT, nothing really. Um, mushrooms, nothing. But cannabis would teach me stuff. Every time I had a cannabis journey, I think I've had about eight or nine cannabis journeys. And uh, the last time, uh, I, it told me, you don't need to take it anymore. You don't need to do this anymore. Right? Um, it, that was the seventh time. I actually did it an eighth time afterwards, and I, I found out why I shouldn't take it. Was, um, it. was it slightly negative? Was it a little bit too much? It was, a, it was negative. Um, and, and you know what, I actually, I actually, uh, blotted it out of my memory. Um, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a bit frightening actually, because, um, I posted about it on Facebook and one, uh, one day it popped up as one of those, uh, you know, memories. And I was like, right. oh, I forgot about that. That's it was, what happens it was in like literally... post-traumatic stress syndrome when something so traumatic, you, you have to blot it out. Right. Yeah. That, that's what I did because, um, what happened was, um, again, I took a little bit too much um, cannabis oil and I entered into what I can only describe as a spiritual battle. Um, it was, there was, there was some entity and it was trying to terrify me. So it was trying to find what would terrify me. Um, wow. So um, I had a childhood fear of spiders and so it was, it was, you know, presenting spite, massive spiders to me. But um, I've been living off grid, you know, in a motorhome in the country for so many years. Uh, and I'm not afraid of spiders anymore. You had <laughs> to overcome got that fear. It was, it was a necessity, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, but what it was doing was like it was testing me, and it, you know, I could, I could almost feel that it was observing my responses to see what it could do to frighten me. And so I, I had like a, a good couple of hours of being almost, you know, almost terrified, but having to be strong through it. So I, you know, I didn't give this, this thing clues, as it were. Um, and then um, I, I prayed. Um, and when I prayed, um, I was able to, to, to jump out of the, the trip um and uh and yeah um i was able to overcome it but uh but yeah i i literally had what they would call a spiritual battle and it was so it must have been so terrifying that i i literally blotted it out of my memory it's crazy i had a very similar experience the last time i properly smoked dmt which was the last time after nothing to boast about by the way a couple of hundred times of smoking over a couple of years period and I'd already sort of decided that I'd seen enough. I'd been as far as I needed to go outside the meat suit. I'd been as close as I need to be to the infinite everything. 
Uh, but lo and behold, I, I, and I went into this in quite a lot of detail in the plant medicine thing a couple of weeks ago. Lo and behold, I smoked it that one more time when I, I didn't really even mean to smoke it. I was facilitating someone mm. else. I shouldn't have done it. And it absolutely um, pulled my pants down and spanked my bum metaphysically. Um, to say the least, I won't go into the full details of what happened. <coughs> but um, yeah, it, it, it sounds very similar, very similar really to what happened to you. It's that one last time, which was unnecessary. And it, and, and it taught you, yeah. it taught you the final lesson, which maybe, you know, we all need it. We always need the lesson in, in, in retrospect, but at the time when it's happening, it's like, oh, fuck, what's going on? Yeah, not so great. Well, um, again, um, I found that uh, Terence McKenna. Um, yes, I'm big sure up Terence. Come across him, of course. Big, big fan, um, of, big fan of Terence, mate. Yeah. Well, he he talks about the entities that you you encounter, you know, once you're in this dimension, um, and I believe that if you get there through artificial means, if you get there through alcohol or, or drugs you get to a level where you meet these entities if you get there if you go there naturally you're there on your own essentially you're there in a, a a level of this place where these entities aren't aren't around but if you go there um with using drugs or something you you know that's where you can you end up interacting with these things and you know the more you um inhabit that level the more power they end up having over you. Um, yeah. And that's what I think um, the cannabis told me, right? Don't do it anymore because, you know, you're, you're, you're getting to the point where you can be compromised. Right? Yeah. So, and I, I ignored it because uh, somebody gave me um, a sweet, like a, a little sweet that was laced with this stuff. And, um, Somebody gave it to me, and I, I just put it in the fridge. Just a little and sweetie. <laughs> yeah, and I thought, you know, I've got that sweet in there. Let me let me try it. You know, <laughs> no, I wish I hadn't now. So, um, so yeah, that was the last time I ever did it. Yeah, well, I think sometimes we all need, need that that sort of a uh, goodbye kick up the bum. Well, uh, just to yeah. show us what the you know, I, I, I'm a, an advocate. Sometimes you've got to do things right to the limit to know where the limit is. Well. Um, as I said, I think this this place that we're in and uh, our, our job here is to is to experience. And uh, you know, I I chose um, years ago, two thousand three, two thousand four. I actually asked I, I to to know. I, I wanted to know the truth, whatever that might be. And uh, for the last twenty years, I've been on that journey to find the truth. And again, I feel like I've been I've been led to see certain things, to have certain things deconstructed, to have some things explained to me and uh, for me to experience them and, and pass them on, pass on what I find out to, uh, to anybody who wants to know. Um, and that follows in with uh, uh, me finding out what my purpose is. Um, so somebody did this little process on me and it told me what my purpose in this world is. And the, the, the words that I was told were to help and inspire by just being you. And that's what I, I think I've been doing for the last 20 years. Yeah, you, you, you do do that, mate. You're very relatable. And one comment which I saw earlier on, was someone said, even if I don't agree with everything this guy is saying, his, gen his, his genuine nature is shining through. Um, and, and I think what you're very good at, and I'll never forget the first time I saw you in a video, you're on, you're on a f foreign talk show on TV explaining so to someone how it, a vacuum can't be, how, how, how basically an atmosphere can't exist in a vacuum, etc. And I was like, who is this guy? He, um, he sort of has a knack to make these concepts very relatable for people. Um, so I think I think that's certainly a gift you have, mate. Certainly. Well, I think it's because my my um, my job. Uh, I was a computer programmer, but I was very specialised in what I did. I was a front end designer, right? Um, and I'm I'm lucky because I um, I've got my you know equal equal use of my my two halves of my brain. So um, I was a programmer and a graphic designer. So um, my speciality was 
doing the front end, the bit of the software that people interact with. So um, I, my job was to take um, lots and lots of data uh, that's very difficult to understand and present it in a way that um, was understandable to people. So, so literally, it's it's what I what I've been doing for the last thirty years. No, it's it's um, mate, it's been great to have you on. I'm just conscious of the time we've had you for almost the best part of three hours now. Um, uh, to wrap things up, is there any is there any closing thoughts or anything we haven't mentioned tonight on on this subject of uh, making the best of the fourth dimension? What what can people take away? from your talk tonight uh, that they can apply it on a day-to-day -day basis do you think right well there's um there's a lot to it so uh uh when i get when i get back i'm planning to to start something called the dreamworks club so basically teach people uh, and teach myself at the same time how to consciously act you know and sort of use this use this uh, fourth dimension um so uh yeah hopefully I'll, I'll get that um up and running there's so much to go into uh especially talking about how to um overcome the barriers that have been placed you know in our psyches to stop us doing this um i, I can give you one example of a one barrier um, sure if we've still got time yeah, yeah, yeah. um uh, okay imagine um okay so the the idea is that your imagination is is more powerful than your intent so what i mean by that is uh imagine imagine that i've got this plank of wood that's 10 feet long and about uh you know a, a foot wide okay and i place that on the floor and i told you walk across walk across this plank of wood without touching the floor do you think you could do that only in my imagination no no i mean think about it if you're a foot a foot wide yeah 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 and it's 10 foot long do you think you can walk along that oh if that? you really had that, that a plank of wood like that um yeah 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 i do balance on that easily you yeah. could you could easily do it you could hop across it you could run across it um you'd you could walk um you'd probably do it blindfold yeah now yeah. so what if i took that plank of wood and put it 100 foot in the air between two buildings Right? Do you think you could do it now? No. no. No, absolutely not, because your imagination of what you think would happen will prevent you from doing it. In fact, if you try to do it, that imagination will probably cause your death, right? Because you're, you'll be focused on, what if I fall off? And then you'll fall off, yeah? So that's a good example of negative manifestation, I guess. Yeah, ex exactly. And that's when you when you actually try and make something happen, right? Your imagination of of what that might entail, right, is going to prevent you from making it happen. Hmm. No. So that's one totally of the barriers. Agree. And uh, and yeah, so there are exercises we can do to actually uh, get around that and uh, and. Um, and get around all the other barriers that we can, you know, we'll, we'll come up against. So um, I haven't got anything I can really say to, to anybody at this point, but if I get this, this DreamWorks Club up and running, um, maybe we can start uh, getting people to, to uh, you know, actually use these abilities naturally. I can. I may. I think I'm going to send you an email about that. I can see maybe we can collaborate with Raw Academy and and bring that to the, on a on a Thursday night. Maybe not on the live on a Friday night when it, we're trying to have an entertaining chat. That's maybe a bit more in depth. That kind of stuff. We'll have a chat about that, mate. That sounds very interesting. Okay. Um, okay. Dave, what um, if people want to get hold of more of your stuff, uh, what's the best ways for people to get hold of you? Is it a central website or just go on YouTube or what? Um. So my website is allegedlydave.com. Okay. Um, uh, so on YouTube, uh, BitChute, Odyssey, and Rumble, um, put at allegedly Dave, and uh, you'll get my stuff. Some of our good uh, hearted mods did have some links for you earlier on in the chat. Uh, moderators, if you uh, have those links, please put them in the chat. We can get them on the screen. Dave, I just want to say uh, a massive thank you for joining us here on Rise Above. It's been an absolute pleasure. This is the second time we've chatted to you um tonight i hope it's not going to be the last 
Um, we definitely need uh, maybe to have another catch up in six months' time or or so. So yeah, mate, thank you very much for coming on and uh, rise above. Rise above. I'm honoured to be here. Thanks, guys. Um, it's good to be back. All right, take care, mate. Okay. Allegedly, See Dave. You later. Rise above, generation. See you later, bro. Rise above, yeah. Right, I tell you what. Um, just before we, we 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 are going to wrap up the show soon, but I'm just I just need to drop a music video from Ryan Sanders because let me just find it. We are giving away more Ryan Sanders CDs, right? And um, anyone that purchases any merch tonight before midnight, any 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 purchase whatsoever off the website, it's going to get a free Ryan Sanders CD. Let's just uh, play this. This is I can't remember what this one's called. You'll find out very soon. <laughs> Moving radical in a world that feels forsaken Trying to move righteous, I see them following Satan Moving radical in a world that feels forsaken Trying to move righteous, I see them following Satan We'll see where he takes them, they move blind and ignorant I just can't debate them, so far God pray God can save them The people are lost, they worship algorithms Claim to be a boss, but they're all what an alpha isn't Went down some path for some clout and bad decisions I overcome their darkness, now I just stand here grinning Moving radical in a world that feels forsaken Trying to move righteous, I see they're following Satan We'll see where he takes them, they move blind and ignorant I just can't debate them so far, God pray God can save them Sat here wondering, has Babylon fallen yet? So many led astray, the evil one distorted them They try to nest, no discipline, their cause is dead when a man moves unrighteous with no God, he turns to an awkward mess Get possessed by Leviathan spirit, I don't require them digits Snakes in the grass and sociopaths can't try me with it There's nobody like me with it How did I come so far so quick? The most high did it, true to the word, make sure there's no lies in it Moving radical in a world that feels forsaken Trying to move righteous, I see they're following Satan We'll see where he takes them, they move blind and ignorant I just can't debate them so far, God pray God can save them they don't believe us, but I'd rather be us The armies of heaven come to capture those who deceive us Eyes wide open, they keep their eyes wide shut Man dug deep for the truth, so I can never bite my tongue I remember reading tarot, but there's nine truths in a lie They're lurking deep in the shadows, they all want piece of the pie They want to take your destiny, sometimes they sit next to me Whispering like they're friends of me, this gift of discernment's heavenly Moving radical in a world that feels forsaken Trying to move righteous, I see they're following Satan We'll see where he takes them, they move blind and ignorant I just can't debate them so far, God pray God can save them So that was Forsaken World by Ryan Sanders. I, I, I didn't get the uh, name right at the start. And uh, yeah, I was just saying to Manic, right? Don't forget, Ryan Sanders produces, mixes down, masters, and does all of that himself. Yeah, so again, anyone that makes any purchase whatsoever, even if it's a few stickers off of the website, you will be getting a free Ryan Sanders CD. Right, just before we do wrap up tonight, remember, next week we have... The organisers from Sounds Beautiful Festival coming on the show. There is going to be some special giveaway or discount or a little something special for the uh, for the Ramish community for this event that we are appearing at. MC Manic, are you uh, intro? Are you are you excited to be? Uh, I think we were on before Slip now or some something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm just uh, looking forward to being there and being able to rep rise above, man. Yeah, it's going to be, uh, it's a while since we've actually properly shared a stage together. The last was, was actually Raw Treat, mm. I yeah. think so, yeah. So, um, yeah, make sure you tune in next week. We're also going to be hearing about Inspector Veg, and he's going to be telling us all about his interactive health workshop, which is um, with Raw Academy. That will be coming, that will be coming soon. Um, and also, the week after that, on the 28th, 
There's no show on a Friday, but we're going to be doing a Raw Academy live, myself and Andy PG, and it's going to be all about Ramesh content creation. Live in the studio, we're going to be making some thumbnails and some of the graphics for the show, and I'm actually going to show you like behind the scenes how we do it, some, uh, including an Al Gore tutorial as well. We're going to be talking all about that kind of stuff and actually doing a free Raw Academy for you guys to give you a taste of what's available on the Thursday nights if you do choose to sign up. So, yeah, we are back live next week. MC Manic, Johnny, thank you very much for joining me, mate. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, allegedly Dave was amazing. Awesome guest. Don't forget to tune in next week, and I will finish off. Let's have, um, let's have a tune from myself. What have we got here? I'll tell you what, I'm going to play Came to the Jungle. Yeah. The new, the new video I've made. Here we go. Right, see you guys next week. Rise above. So the spirits come along and they say to me, you have to go into the jungle and you're going to drink ayahuasca. So I went into the jungle, I found a shaman, and I drank ayahuasca. And during that first ceremony, I found my apprenticeship. As we tear down Babylon, brick by brick, piece by piece, force them to smithereen, over big double L, yeah. see? Jungle, looking for the shaman To learn knowledge, to get trained I've got questions, need explaining Who manifests these spells we are making? Who talk for days, no words are spoken The third eye's wide open My seven chakras are woken Then the Babylon fell but broken Come to the jungle, now I'm the shaman Draw for the power of thunder, rain It's no mortal combat I won't draw for swords, I'm not on that Why? The vibration's high can't test like an eye I speak to the Buddha and Rastafari right. When we chat to the prophet, it's all no lie Who would have shame us? Smoke for the Rasta Learn from the prophet, teach the pasta They go serve the same master Who would have question? What ask? Who would have shame us? Smoke for the Rasta Learn from the prophet, teach the pasta They go serve the same master Who would have question? What ask? Deep in the jungle, knees in the dirt Next to the tribal leader Speaking the words of the healer I'm feeding the words Seeking the teacher vine Mimos are creeper And they are iron hibitar Any old vine can't mimic us Safe for mixtures, boiled in Vinegar, recipe taught by ancient visitors To be on the ground, I feel like I'm slipping away When my eyes look through to the clearing The zombies stand on my face, it's burning What's that in my peripheral hearing? Ingesting the chemical gateway Exiting the physical plane Inspecting the neural pathway Assessing the spiritual pain You would have shame us, smoke with a rasta Learn from the prophet, teach the pasta They go serve the same master Two many questions, one ask You would have shame us, smoke with a rasta Learn from the prophet, teach the pasta They go serve the same master Two many questions, one ask now, it's uh, no joke to drink ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, all right, boga. One dose, game over. Half the forest, chilling with the elders, learning customs of ancient cultures. Shamanic technology. We fulfill the prophecy. No words described this logically. Close both eyes, you might see properly. Wait. Can you feel it? Hold it in before you release it. You got the key to revealing the secret. They tried hard to conceal it. Wait, how you feeling? Is it illusion? Is it the real thing? See it isn't always believing, hallucinating or lucid dreaming. Who would have shamed us? Smoke with a rasta. Learn from the prophet, teach the pastor. They will serve the same master. Who would have questioned? What ask? Who would have shamed us? Smoke with a rasta. Learn from the prophet, teach the pastor. They will serve the same master. Who would have questioned? What ask?